Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where creativity comes to donate extensive amounts of bone marrow prior to being pilfered of its rotting corpse until every last cent is squeezed meticulously from every last orifice. First on the docket, we have... Wanda? Dottie. I have a daughter. She's eight. If you could just let her out of her room. If, if I could just hold her, please. My husband's on a business trip. Tell him I love him. Not to come back here, ever. You're all going to be fine. When you let us sleep, we have your nightmares. No. Your grief is poisoning us. No, stop. Please, let us go. If you won't let us go, just let us die. Well, I think we handled that well. Just let us die. WandaVision saw the magic systems in the MCU crumble as inane spells, insane power levels, and impossibilities became so commonplace and hard to understand that nothing in the realm of witchcraft and wizardry will ever be the same. As if that wasn't enough, Wanda Maximoff was summarily character assassinated as well, conducting mass torture and slavery with no discrimination of age while condemning the only person with the power to stop her to a lifetime of puppetry. To then flee the scene as soon as the authorities decided to even attempt to hold her accountable. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. You need to reassess your entire existence. Second was the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, a beast of its own. By the time you complete all six episodes, you realize the writers were hell-bent on showing us Bucky, Sam, and the socio-political world of the MCU get written into shredded lasagna, supported by all the moral fortitude of a melted crayon, which is on theme as the children who wrote this were particularly aggressive in their messaging. You've got to do better, Senator. Thank you. I feel like an activist already. The show managed to take several steps in destroying both Sam and Bucky as they laughed in the face of their fellow soldiers coming close to death several times at the hands of people committing the same sins the show tries to condemn. <laughs> only to lead us to the wonderful world of Loki, a show that destroyed the concept of free will and any sense of meaning in any choice throughout every single MCU film to date. And this idea was presented to us as carefully as buttering your toast with an anvil. But in keeping with the other shows, they didn't skimp on assassinating their protagonist either. beyond reason, but he is of Asgard, and he is my brother. He killed 80 people in two days. And I will be true heir to the throne. You can't kill an entire race. Why not? <laughs> They're gonna let these people die. They're gonna let these people die. Loki, I don't even know if this is gonna work. You go, I go. Everyone for sentiment, were you? 
easier to let it burn. Fantastic. We were dealing with Avengers 2012, Loki, but after watching a movie about what he may or may not have done and what that may or may not have led to, he has a complete change in values. I guess he just flops from character to character. His personality is about as well fortified as a particularly depressed noodle. Wow. This experience wasn't made easier by the fact that the title is mostly a lie. The show wasn't about Loki, it was about his female counterpart, the character who makes the significant choices at the end of the story. The character Loki hides behind. The character who slaughters the agents with ease where Loki is humiliated. Being a trickster is knowing everyone knows you're a trickster and then many of your tricks can come from exploiting the fact that you know, that they know, that you know. Okay, just, 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 just shut up, please. It's just you know. Okay, shut up. I have been waiting for this moment my entire life. I just need a second to get my head straight, okay? Sure, of course. You must understand, she has to put up with the little frost giant who conjures himself a blankie when he gets cold, because this was never about him. This isn't about you. And so, you would think Marvel has the decency to spare me more of this rancid storytelling as I am running out of food-related comparisons, yet here we are. Black Widow. A film that by all expectations should have slipped under the radar, settling calmly in the world of inoffensive sludge. A simple story about Natasha Romanoff discovering more of her roots, her heritage, and perhaps her legacy, not to mention discovering those she may have lost along the way. However, we got something else, something that warrants the title of this video. And so with that, I invite you, dear viewer, to come along for a journey into the first film of the MCU's fourth phase. A phase inaugurated by a level of writing that has provided what can only be described as a quintessential clown movie. We open up on a look back into Natasha's childhood, all the way back in 1995. She was living with her undercover family, her sister Yelena, her father Alexei, and her mother Melina. Alexei returns home from a presumably hard day's work to chat with the kids and his wife before mentioning they have limited time before the police are going to capture them and take them in as undercover spies. He then has a nice sit down and explains that they're going on a big adventure. Man, really feeling the heat and the rush right now. I really hope these crucial seconds don't cost you significantly. Nah, it'll be fine. Wait, what the fuck am I doing in Mauler's review? Jesus, how much toilet duck did I drink last night? Go back to sleep, drinker. Alexei then preps his gun and moves the family out of the house to the car, in order to eventually reach an airplane. It would seem the police arrive at his street just as he leaves it, and lucky for him, there's no blockade nor attempt to stop and search the cars. You'd think they would have had his license plate to look out for, since he's a fully legalized citizen, even if it's forged, and they know his identity and his place of residence, and this is S.H.I.E.L.D. chasing him. How long do we have? I don't know. Like an hour, maybe. Seems like you didn't even have that, but I'm still stuck back at how the fuck you managed to conclude one hour was your window when the police were right outside as you left. What metric could you possibly be using for police response time when escaping an incinerated facility with the police on your tail? Whatever that metric was, you were wrong. Anyway, upon reaching the plane, it would seem there's an inconvenient obstacle in front. A dump car, typically seen attached to a train. I'm not sure how they'll deal with this, it's rather heavy and... Oh, I... He's stronger than Cap? Alexei then refuses to enter the plane as it's leaving, to instead shoot at police that are gradually arriving. Naturally, that prompts them to shoot back while even aiming to shoot the children in the back seat of the plane. Everyone is on form today. <laughs> Ah, so the mother is actually shot. Bear in mind that nobody on either side is gunning for the wheels of the escaping or pursuing vehicles. Even the car that drives right up to the wings refuses to use any projectile weaponry. Would have been mighty inconvenient if they did. Natasha then pilots the plane with her mother's instructions while several police cars show up ahead to unload shots into the cockpit and the body of the plane. Only, they seem to make it out just fine. There's no compromise of the airflow or their fuel. It's so lucky, because you see, if I I were the mum and dad in this scenario, I probably would have panicked and corralled the whole family right into the car immediately. I wouldn't have slouched into the dining room, have myself a drink, tell the mum that we have limited time, and then have a sit down while taking this long to prep. Because if they had even one extra minute, they would have been fine in this scenario. Anyway, we see they arrive in Cuba, with the mum getting medical attention for her gunshot wound, and... <sighs> 
what the fuck? You're telling me on this family-stocked, shot-to-hell-and-back single-engine plane they managed to travel from Ohio to Cuba with no refuel or detection from 1995 police bolstered by S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA specifically looking to capture spies. And we already know they had tech like this. Their dinky plane isn't escaping shit. Not only do they have to fly very bloody low to account for the windows, you can easily make out an identification of the craft. And you are traveling through American airspace. They need at least twice the tank they have to make the distance, and their windows are shot to hell, further fucking up the fuel efficiency and the state of the occupants, which in this case is a full cabin, only adding more fuel requirements for liftoff. And Ray, the totally Russian Winston, says... Red. Guardian returns. I swear to God, why the fuck did they try and make a 64-year-old born and raised Londoner known for being the muscle man under a multitude of gangsters be fucking Drakov? It's my network of widows that help me control the scales of power. Nobody is ever going to believe this bad is Russian. Don't tell me to stop! So anyway, Natasha takes a gun and threatens the entire compound with it. She's pissed off that she doesn't get to have her nice fake suburban life anymore and must return to the Red Room. <laughs> You guys honestly suck. Natasha makes it clear that she doesn't want her not-sister to be taken to the Red Room either. Alexei manages to disarm her while telling her something very reassuring. Can't. She's only six. You were even younger. Fucking hell, sign her up, I guess. Though then again, if these two are fully indoctrinated and aware of the undercover situation, why did Alexei describe them fleeing the police in the beginning as a big adventure? Why would you waste time trying to lie to these kids about how they've been exposed and desperately need to leave when they are as aware of the undercover operation as you are? Like, it works for the audience. It makes us think we're dealing with a normal family, only for it to unravel. But it makes no sense for these characters to say these things. And with that, we enter the opening credits, showing us a montage of Natasha and his sister being moved through human trafficking and built up to become Black Widows, world-class assassins that work for Drakov, <clears throat> with a cover of Smells Like Teen Spirit in the background. That was a choice. We are shown children being experimented on, indoctrinated, being shown super old cartoons while in the latter half of the 90s, I guess? We also see a whole bunch of poorly photoshopped Ray Winstons making their way through history. Because of course, he's the big bad. Unfortunately, outside of a few seconds in the latter portion of the film, this is all we get in terms of the indoctrination program for the Black Widows. This is everything we are shown in terms of how they are built and what they are taught. Just seems like a missed opportunity to me. Regardless, this movie's real-time plot is set slap bang inside Captain America Civil War. The idea being that when Natasha facilitated Steve and Bucky's escape, she cost her standing with the task force. T'Challa told Ross what she did, so they're coming for you. Somehow, she managed to escape that compound alone and make her way to a ship setting sail for her handler in all things espionage. At the same time, she set up a decoy that was patched into in order to talk to Secretary Ross when he showed up to it. You're embarrassing yourself. It looks desperate. I don't know why she would bother with anything but the decoy. Even speaking to Ross just to gloat would only give him a sliver of a chance to track you further, and she hangs up on him just to leave. I think this scene is only here to show us that she's ten steps ahead of Ross despite already making choices that endanger her for no reason at all. Bit wonky, but moving on. Morocco. And some really slick editing. <laughs> Okay, for context, we are watching a set of Black Widows attack and attempt to steal something from this woman. So let's just... can we see that again? Yeah, so she's hit by an opening door that I guess Blonde Widow had prepped, even though she was rushing to catch up with her, so this was just great timing, not to mention luck that she was even choosing to walk on this side, and that pushed her into the center of the road only to get her hit by a car. So the car is driven by a Randy, meaning this was simply an incredible set of events that put this woman at an extreme disadvantage. Second, why didn't she see this car, and why didn't the car do anything to avoid hitting her? Unless we're saying that Blondie managed to organize this spontaneous 
simultaneous chase to involve a door she's breaching out of to hit her target directly to then have her fall onto an oncoming car that was so close it could do nothing to change its pathway? And third, did they count on the person driving this car to not pull over? Because man, I am super impressed by these world-class assassins remaining fully under the radar at this point, mainly through the public never recording or mentioning anything to anyone. <laughs> So Blondie and the lady get into a scrape, and she pulls an epic Arya Stark move to end the lady's life. Sorry, Ray move, I guess. Stop doing this move. But before drawing her last breath, she lets loose some floomp juice. <laughs> Or gas, I guess. I'm gonna call it juice. And so we need some understanding here. This lady has a bunch of anti-mind control vials and she let one loose as Blondie killed her. Probably should have had this prepared when you realized Black Widows were hunting you since it instantly converts them to your team and the Black Widows probably should have had orders to dispatch you from a distance to avoid this sort of result specifically. But you know, it's not like she has anything other than the knife. Nope, nothing she could possibly use to her advantage here. And there's no argument for avoiding notoriety when they've already screamed incessantly and began a knife fight in the middle of a busy road. Stay at a fucking distance. They know you have the vials, that's why they're chasing you, and their bosses know the vials instantly turn them, but... Okay, lucky for Blondie, no other Black Widow shows up before she can leave and she takes the vials, not to mention digging out the chip from her thigh. We can talk about that later. Natasha is then seen entering a safe house of sorts, thanks to the handler. She is given new covers, but no physical identity obscuring technology. Not sure if the movie is aware, but Black Widow, or Natasha Romanoff, is currently wanted worldwide for a significant breach of the Sokovian Accords, not to mention assaulting the King of Wakanda. <laughs> A young and forgotten to be the Stera Avengers. Steve Rogers and Natasha Romanoff have a free foot. This woman will not make it through a fucking Uber without getting recognized, let alone a damn airport. She's more famous in this world than Scarlett Johansson is in ours. Anyway, it would seem that she's also received some mail. Turns out Blondie was actually the sister Natasha had in the beginning, Yelena. All growed up. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that too. But first, what do we know is happening here? Well, Yelena, Natasha's sister, had the vials that undo mind control at her disposal, as well as in-depth knowledge of the current operations for the Black Widows and Drakov's Third Act Fortress. She also has the means to get these vials to those individuals, whether in the form of surprising them as they attack her, or through other approaches. She has the capabilities of freeing her fellow sisters and the chance to swell the ranks of a resistance to become a serious threat to Drakov's operation. Keeping that all in mind, she mailed the vials to Natasha's safe house in Budapest. Yeah, she, she has the fucking... It's the literal key to removing mind control from world-class assassins that are currently hunting you. Women you know and worked alongside who are forced to do this through no fault of their own and you sent it off to a place you shouldn't even know about. And you did that in the hopes that it reaches a woman who might not be there nor can absolutely be trusted nor would have any understanding of what to do with them. Fucking galaxy brain. In reality she would treat these vials as a second skin. They would stay on her no matter what. You don't send these through fucking FedEx in the hopes that someone you know might pick them up. The only reason it reached Natasha is that her espionage man collected it and said that a current undercover agent received it in the Budapest safe house, marked for Natasha. Meaning he just cycles people in and out of a safe house, collecting mail from all of the prior occupants, which, correct me if I'm wrong, fucking obliterates the very point of a safe house. Yeah. You'd be like, uh, get out of the safe house right now. The fact that somebody <laughs> is sending mail to there to get to secret agents? Like, what the hell? <laughs> this is this very is bad. This is not good. This is a compromise save. We need to figure out who knows about this, what's going on. Is the organization breached? That's really bad news. And the fact that anybody can just send Natasha stuff at will when she's currently wanted worldwide, she's not bothered by that at all. She's like, oh, hey, mail. Neat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You've got mail. I'd yeah, be really fine weird. with uh, the idea that they could maybe pass messages along if they're actually aware of each other, but even that's risky as fuck. Like, that's just not how it runs. You don't do you that. You wouldn't want your co your agents communicating in that not kind really, of way. No. Especially if they have nothing to do with each other. Like, it's strictly a friend thing. It's like, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Not to mention this is lucky as fuck. Imagine the contact considered the safe house compromised because of this and left, destroying the contents of the mail or leaving it behind. What if the hand 
Chandler refuses to pass it on for security reasons. The whole movie dies if anyone operates as expected. And why the fuck does Natasha not have her own safe house to begin with? If she did, which would make sense, this guy couldn't get this shit to her anyway. She was an Avenger. Could you imagine the resources she had to be able to create something safe in case of something like this? Sorry you went through the trouble, I would have told you to chuck it. She literally says she would have told him to throw it had she known he was going to bring it. Oh, movie. So moving on, Natasha packs everything up and preps to leave her safe caravan, only her power goes out and it seems she heads out to get a refill. You'd think she'd be way more on edge right now with everything going on, approaching the generator with a gun and stuff, but fine, don't worry about it. All this does is add to what I think about her capabilities as an experienced assassin, that's all. So she drives down this long and lonesome road, thinking about the fun times, crossing into this bridge and... <laughs> So she's dead. Again. Literal fucking missile into the side of her car, or rather, something more specific than that. But I wouldn't want to spoil. A brand new villain for the MCU then emerges from the offending vehicle. It's Taskmaster. Though, as everyone knows, the abilities of such a brute are that of firing explosive shots at the cost of movement speed. What the fuck do I mean by that? Well, good old Mask Tasker here struggles to approach Natasha in anything close to a reasonable amount of time. Luckily, she's not knocked out, nor is she unable to operate at full capacity as she manages to recover, come to awareness of the situation, draw her gun from her back seat, comment on the likelihood of this person being sent by Ross, and then open fire after delivering a quip, with task manager choosing to slowly list over to her in what could only be described as Zack Snyder level slow motion. But then, a shield deflection and a throw. <laughs> Oh boy, lucky that shield didn't make it through that weakened steel frame. I hope we don't get any examples of it going through much more than that in future. Also, it's a huge break for Natasha that Mask Fastener uses projectile explosives but doesn't use a handgun. Or any gun, for that matter. She'd be dead if that were the case. Similarly, she'd be dead if a second explosive arrow was opted in for. But lucky for her, Taskaruni only uses one per mission. But suddenly, a disappearance. Where in the world did this monster go. There's not a sight or sound. Oh, I don't see how they managed to stay secret there, especially against someone like Black. <laughs> Well, hey, that's kind of neat. I hope we get more of this mimic thing. Anyway, before Black Widow is executed by this clearly more capable foe, it is displayed that a redirection to the vials is in order, that Natasha is not the primary target. Now, I know what you're thinking. Surely you wouldn't be stupid enough to simply walk away when someone is actively trying to kill you simply because you need to collect some vials. It should be obvious that she is protecting them, or at least behaves as the vials' obstacle, and I would say presents a serious threat. In fact, the visor states it very clearly. She's 88% of a threat. What the fuck does that mean? 88% of a threat? Like 88% likely to attack you or 88% likely to kill you? In either case, she's 12% away from being 100% of a fucking threat, so maybe don't- oh. Walking off to the case because 88% isn't enough these days. Like, what if Black Widow just stabs you in the back? Yeah, like that. You fucking idiot. How is Ass Blaster even that threatening if they're gonna turn her back to their enemy in the middle of a fight and actually suffer for it? Like, I get it, you want the vials, not Natasha, but it's stupid regardless. You know what? I actually can't be sure of that motivation. I need someone to point it out. Are you not here for me? No shit. So they get back into a tussle until Scoutmaster manages to disarm and have at mercy Black Widow. Only there's no execution, no neck break, no stab. Just a blow that pushes Natasha about four meters back. All of that force localized directly to the chest. Black Widow is tanking incredibly significant damage, and we've not hit the second act. This woman has lost some internal integrity. She is human, after all. But on the other hand, if this is mysteriously not going 
going to stop her at all, then Flaccid Master just decided to spare her, again. Despite being hell-bent on getting these vials, with Black Widow constantly getting in the way. Regardless, we get another walk away, another fight, another walk away, another fight, another walk away, and then an unusual use of the grappling hook we've seen many times before. <laughs> Damn, lucky that case didn't get grabbed or the whole movie would have been fucked. Actually, why the fuck would the explosive arrow have been the smart decision when you wanted to get what was in the truck? Like, isn't this actually a really stupid move and it makes it more difficult for the writers to justify Natasha being alive? Just shoot out the tires for fuck's sake. Also, probably would have been useful to have pulled out that little device a whole lot earlier, but hey, we can't all be perfect. Now, I picture that there are some in the audience thinking, you know what, Mauler? You are a nitpicker. Pod, can here didn't have a gun or a knife, and you are saying there should have been an execution? Well, bucko, there just ain't the potential for one. GG. Except, like, right here where Shotmaster pulls one out to escape this trap thing. So why the fuck wouldn't you execute her this whole time, you fucking idiots? In fairness, there is an attempt. Quite the kick is delivered to Black Widow, to the point of flinging another several meters after having crashed back first into a car. Feel like that would probably fuck you up quite a bit, but that's fine. Down she goes. This makes things easy for Skull Master, since the target is wounded with limited options for escape. And you can detect the vials at a distance, not to mention probably seeing her in the water. But oh well, Natasha isn't followed. She makes it out. Okay. Man, what a great scene. What gets us along in the plot, however, is that Natasha realizes that the vials Tasky Masty was after have a photo of her and Yelena from 1995, the photo she had hung on to when they split up in the opening montage. I don't know how in the world she hung on to that for 21 years, nor how Drakov would have allowed her to keep it when they have to separate all ties, but as luck would have it, there it is. This makes Nat decide to go to the safe house in Budapest. She thinks that that's where his sister currently is, considering that's where his sister sent the vials to be sent to Nat. It's amazing how much the plot would have changed already had Nat been curious enough to begin with to check a package sent to her by someone using a safe house carried through by another undercover agent, but fuck it, why look into that? She's significantly wounded, she just lost all of her gear, she's being hunted by a super assassin, and she's wanted worldwide. Now, Natasha is in Denmark, which is a long way away from Budapest, yet she managed to travel successfully to that safe house. She doesn't even wear the patented MCU cap and sunglasses. Or how about using the face mask technology used in Winter Soldier that they eventually use in this very film? It's fine, nobody recognizes her, it's totally chill. You guys remember when Bucky Barnes was searched for worldwide for related crimes and his image was plastered onto the news and they found him almost immediately in Bucharest? That's not the same with Natasha, because reasons. Oh wait, I was wrong, she's in Norway, not Denmark. <laughs> That's much worse. Uh, you could say that. We're looking at significant magnitudes of impossibility being added on. But that's not the only insane strain on the membrane here. Nat and Yelena meet up, and before we talk about the other thing that happens... <laughs> I want to explain to you guys what the plot has been in terms of comboing up with the MCU lore and this film having gotten us to this point. For what we're about to discuss, I require that you try and stay with me, gentle viewers. This explanation is as of Natasha and Yelena discussing everything that's happened. So, Natasha Romanov was found out and hunted by Hawkeye on the orders of S.H.I.E.L.D. back in the 2000s. He made it to Budapest, he found her safe house, and they fought until he decided to spare her. They then teamed up to take out Drakov, by blowing up the building his daughter was in, knowing that he would be with her in that moment. We then get the whole MCU up to Civil War, and Natasha's sister sends her the vials via the handler finding the package. From there, Natasha is supposed to take the vials to the Avengers for analysis, and the eventual takedown of the Red Room by Captain America and friends. Only Natasha didn't react to the vials that way. She instead, from seeing the image of her sister, decided to head to the Budapest safe house in the hopes that she would find her sister there. Incredibly, her sister is here, specifically because she says she didn't think Nat would come to this safe house to look for her. I came here because I thought you wouldn't. You came to her previously used safe house in the hopes that you wouldn't see her there, instead of going to literally anywhere else. Wow. So they will now team up and try to take out the very much alive Drakov, since the Avengers are not an option. Oh, I have things to say. Many uses of the word what, a pinch of the word the, and just a cosmic boatload of the word fuck. So, 
No time to waste. What the fuck? Let's start with this neural divergent handler giving away this safe house that, by the way, is still fully stocked to several people after S.H.I.E.L.D. has pilfered it via Hawkeye. What insane fucking nonsense. This would have been his mission, and it would have been plastered all over the S.H.I.E.L.D. files, meaning it's not only the scene of an assassin almost being assassinated by Hawkeye, a member of the enemy team, it's a safe house that everybody fucking knows about now. Dare I say, at this point, it's quite a not very safe house. Perhaps neither of you should be here, which brings us to wondering, why the fuck are both of you here? Well, on one hand, Yelena ended up there in the hopes of avoiding Natasha specifically. Great fucking writing right there, and totally not convenient for Natasha whatsoever. Assuming she has good reason to be there, which is... You had to come to Budapest, didn't you? Yeah, so these two connected in a world of seven billion because they both had... A feeling. Yelena sent the vials to Black Widow via the handler in the hopes that she would deliver it to Tony Stark who could help analyze them and send Captain America to destroy the Red Room. Why the fuck didn't you mail one of the 15 to Tony fucking Stark with instructions? That would be the most straightforward thing you could possibly do, you fucking cow. And apparently she hasn't caught any of the very public news that Captain America and Black Widow have been removed from the Avengers and are currently being hunted down by the UN for incredible serious crimes. Because if she knew that, she wouldn't have sent the vials, changing the plot entirely. I kept checking the news, expecting to see Captain America bringing down the Red Room. And so, if we grant that, if we say she didn't notice the incredibly important worldwide news despite keeping track of the news, then we still have the problem of why the fuck did she think sending the vials to the Avengers would give them the location of the Red Room? How exactly does analyzing the floop juice give you the location of the Sky Fortress that Drakov controls? The plot of this movie consists of them finding the location because they can't get it from a fucking fucking anti-mind control gas. Because why would anyone think you could, for fuck's sake? Why was this the intelligent move compared to literally trying to free the Black Widows one by one as they come after you? You can still send a vial to Tony. Meanwhile, you build a rebel army to take down Drake of yourself, or give yourselves into the Avengers and provide as much information as you can personally. That's like three different plans from your own POV that means bringing down the Red Room. The only thing assured by mailing the vials away is that you don't have them and Natasha would be confused. But the real kicker of a question here is why pack a photo of Natasha and yourself in with the vials? Why tell her that you sent it if you didn't want her to find you specifically? If you didn't think I'd come here, why'd you send me this? You brought it back here? I'm not here trying to be your friend, but you need to tell me what that is. It's a synthetic gas. Oh, they literally have the question asked, and then they don't answer it. Fantastic work. So, the last set of fuckery in this entire shit show is now on Nat. Why would she have assumed that Yelena would be in a compromised safe house? Many people believe it was Yelena that originally went to the safe house and provided the vials to weapons dealer man under the guise of it being Natasha's property. But he says that he put another one of his undercovers in the safe house because Natasha wasn't going back, and this mail was found by them. Yelena can't be one of his undercovers because she was only just released from a lifetime of working for Drakov. She wouldn't have any normal espionage contacts or handlers. Everything was done through the Red Room, meaning it had to be a different undercover who also decided to move out of the safe house right when Yelena came in, unless Yelena killed them. Regardless, if Yelena was indeed impossibly his undercover, she still gave up the vials for no good reason at all, and had the luck of being handled by the same arms dealer as her sister, whom she is looking for. Unless she knew who handled Nat, in which case this man is not very good at staying under the radar, which is embarrassing considering his job. Regardless, this is about Natasha being stupid. Ignoring the impossibility of her even getting here, why bother? There's good reason to assume that S.H.I.E.L.D. would have this place monitored as a known safe house from Black Widow's history. Perhaps more important, however, this safe house was utilized by Natasha during her time working as a Black 
Black Widow for Drakov, meaning this is a Red Room organized safe house. This will be on Drakov's books. It's incredible. Natasha Romanov is not stupid enough to go here, but it does team these two up, which is amazing, right? What fun adventures lie ahead? I'd also like to point out that we're supposed to believe that this girl here managed to escape the Black Widow mind control for reasons to then steal or synthesize a selection of vials and use only one on a single Black Widow that happened to be Natasha's sister, in spirit if not in name, who she can then contact and make use of but cannot use her connections to the Avengers. Why? Well, because this series of extremely unlikely events all took place in the couple of days where Natasha was ousted from the Avengers and hasn't yet formed up with the Vigilante Avengers. All of this is incredible, but it creates one last problem on top of the toxic shithole of writing we're already dealing with. How did Natasha Romanov, the Black Widow, escape the mind control? And why didn't she tell S.H.I.E.L.D. about it? Perhaps we'll get more on that as the plot progresses. Now if we rewind a little bit, Natasha manages to find a gun just outside of the safe house when she arrives, in this case being an apartment, and then they manage to meet. Lucky the gun was never removed, I guess. I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Then why the fuck did you send her the vials, you donkey-ass dipshit? As Natasha is entering Blondie's abode, she walks past an armory with just about any weapon you might want, only to then pull a gun on Natasha and have a fight to the death. I say to the death because this happens. <laughs> Uh, Yelena tries to stab Nat in the gut with a kitchen knife. She tosses Nat in such a way that she bounces between walls. She smashed a plate on her head. She tries to strangle. If you fucking ingrates are trying to kill each other, then use the guns that are now on the floor. However, if you aren't trying to kill each other, then what the fuck is this scene? What the fuck? Like I get that you guys are mandated to have your action scenes every 10 seconds, but could you support them even slightly when actually presenting these characters as though they don't want to simply kill each other? You're right, that's too much to ask. Instead, we have to watch these fucking insane events unfold to make sure the audience doesn't get bored. I don't wanna be here. I'm on the run, you could've gotten me killed. You could've- yes, you could've gotten her killed, yes. I find this all so fascinating. Why in the world is this safe house fully stocked with weapons, comforts, food and drink while also having been completely exposed by S.H.I.E.L.D.? It's the same damn place Natasha was almost killed by Hawkeye years ago. They point this out. What bullet does that? Not bullets, arrows. Yeah. Excellent. The safe house just never got cleared out or noted, and you can bet that no neighbors wanted to inspect the sheer insane amount of noise they just made. <laughs> that would obviously get in the way. Oh my goodness. So, a selection of Black Widows enter the building, with several of them approaching the exits. They blew through the fucking ceiling in an attempt to capture and or kill Natasha and Yelena. Now you might think this was really cool and not entirely stupid, so let me explain why you're wrong. When you know your targets are extremely dangerous and you know exactly where they are, you don't blow a hole through their fucking ceiling like some manky circus experiment. That makes it so you can't see shit and you can't breathe, on top of the fact that you leave yourself wide open after drawing all of the attention on your arrival. You can't tell if you're shooting your own people, nor how to identify your targets, and you'll have very little knowledge on your own orientation. <laughs> One of them has a fucking afro. This is all especially stupid when you could have everyone wait for them to leave the building, you could gas the building, you could have snipers perched at every opening and then knock them out unwittingly, and you could wear some tactical gear preventing asbestos inhalation, at the very least. Funnily enough, enough, they do have snipers perched at all exits, so maybe I shouldn't be too harsh. Oh, they all miss. 
Lots of, uh, lots of luck in this movie, huh? And we're not even close to the third act. Regardless, this allows them to get to the roof and lose every single widow that was chasing them. Except this one lass. Yes, you heard that right. A black widow is chasing them across the rooftops and she refuses to shoot them with her two pistols. Even to the point of choosing to jump on this pole with them and attempt to use her knife only to fall off. Ugh, you're telling me she has such a boner for killing these targets that she loses all all sense of self-preservation? Because my god, that Black Widow software is embarrassing if so. Anyway, this happens. <laughs> What the fuck a duck is this? You are dead. You are dodo levels of dead. Holy shit. You fell seven fucking stories, Nat. You hit several vents on your way down, flipping you around like a goddamn ragdoll and still landed on your feet? I just, I, the fuck, she's, she's dead. Again, again. But if we rewind a bit, Yelena went face first into a concrete wall and onto a staircase after having crashed through a window. She is also very hurt and I'm starting to wonder if the writers are aware of just how human these two actually are. Humans don't survive this. But then you rewind again. Why the fuck did they decide to unhook this venting tower thing and crash it into a building? Think about it. They could have gone around the other rooftops. They could have hidden behind this vent and surprise attacked the widow. They could even use a vial on her and rescue her from her terrible fate. They could have done many things that don't involve them essentially killing themselves by creating a stationary point-blank target for this woman to make use of while pushing this thing into civilian apartment buildings, endangering everyone involved. Like, this is exceptional. They endanger themselves in order to endanger the public and reach an exit that isn't actually there. Were they planning on going headfirst through a window and down a staircase? Fucking hell, when can we get intelligent female action heroes again? Wait, hang on. Why is this huge tower that's weighty enough to crash into a building held together with one removable latch? There's not even a padlock. There's no security throughout the entire tower except the top but what i find funny she... is like that this thing got pushed over by taking out a little pin and just pushing yeah. it in the middle of a massive city if you like... look at those connectors it looks like you'd have to disconnect all of them no the... <laughs> no <laughs> any regulation wouldn't allow it so that this enormous fucking pole that can blast into a building if it falls over is held by one little latch. Imagine it was built with any kind of reasonable regulation. They'd be sitting there like a couple of fucking bobbleheads trying to convince this Black Widow not to kill herself while trying to kill them. So, yet another incredible adventure into the insane mind of style without substance without the style. Leading us to Natasha trying to make contact and reach some level of truce with the widow who just tried to kill her thanks to mind control. Makes you wonder what Natasha is thinking, but hey, it's the good protagonist thing to do, I guess. Unfortunately, Drakov activates the termination switch on her and she's forced to kill herself. Presumably this is what the chip in the leg does. Think of the mind control as the thing that lets them control you and the chip allows them to do it at a distance. Meaning, if you aren't mind controlled, the chip can't do shit. Which seems like a design oversight, does it not? If they can't execute themselves, which is very possible if they defect or they're captured and restrained, would you not want a device that on command leaks cyanide into their bloodstream or detonates? What do you do if they break both of their arms? Just hope they can hobble to a cliff? Imagine it was a detonation. You activate that the moment they are compromised and you're golden. In fact, had there been a significant sci-fi explosive device attached to this Black Widow, one that could erase most of her tech along with her, both our heroines could be dead. Well, if we're being honest, Yelena would be dead from the moment she was hit with the floomp juice because Drakov would have detonated her immediately. Not only to rid himself of a corrupted widow, but to destroy the vials that compromise the widows as well. Meaning he can't have the detonation devices. Or anything to secure the death of a widow because our story wouldn't work otherwise. God, it's all so depressing. Drakov can't even have the devices be lodged in any deep or secure portion of the body like the skull or the neck or the spine because Yelena has to be able to take it out herself on the spot. Ain't it great when your horrible writing forces you to make other horribly stupid writing decisions? Wonderful. I would argue all of this is made even worse by the fact that had Drakov simply been a few seconds late, this widow would have killed Natasha, which only raises the question of why the fuck didn't he just allow that to happen? These people have clearly been sent for the kill, and this was a perfect opportunity. <sighs> Though it is worth pointing out the effort Yelena puts in here to get a vial to this wayward widow. 
window. As she is bleeding out with a broken leg, still hell-bent on killing them, Yelena approaches her with the interest of using a vial. As luck would have it, she's too late, because it would have been boring and complicated to have another character, but this confirms the motive to actually follow through on what the first girl told her. Free the others. You know, it would have been great for you to release a vial into this widow right here as Natasha brings her down, like I mentioned before, but nah, that would be far too in character. Oh, you know what else would be great? Tossing one stuck to a flashbang into this stairwell. That's a two for one right there. Where are we trying to get? Oh, she threw a grenade. Oh. Okay, those were hard though. She could have been shot for goodness sake, and, and a grenade is, is easier to throw. Probably. It's not like she's dismantled and brought several widows down to the ground ready for vials to be released into them directly. <laughs> So, these vials, if they only hit one person, it would free said person of the mind control and allow them to join your team as they would likely be sympathetic in attempting to release the other widows. At the same time, it takes someone away from Drakov's widow army and chips at his overall control while removing one of the people trying to kill you. And the kicker? You have like 15 vials. Had this been written by someone who doesn't eat paste, and had they implemented the idea of widows using tactical gear on approach, that would have given you reason to think they prepared for the vials, and that trying to apply the vials is far too dangerous. One small solution cancelling out two holes while making your elite fighting force come across as a lot more intimidating. Instead, we sit here wondering why Yelena and Natasha aren't rescuing these women. Not only is it the most practical choice, Choice, the most intelligent choice, and the most moral choice. It's the only choice that matches both of what your characters value. But these two? These two are some of the most witless, selfish, foul cunts to ever grace this earth. You didn't use a single vial to save any of the people who are suffering since their childhoods, the exact same fate Yelena was forced to endure until just two days ago. You've not even had a conversation about it when the explicit purpose of those vials was to rescue people from this horrifying experience. Yelena was released during a fight to the death for fuck's sake. Your job, in full, is to pop a canister in the vicinity of any of these people and watch as they fight with you to provide more and more of these women freedom. Yet you let them sit in subjugation, walking themselves off rooftops trying to kill you, only to then execute themselves. Stellar job both of you. I really hope these are the only instances of absolute immoral bullshit in this story. It would suck if there was more. Anyway, this scene goes on for quite a bit. They essentially mope while approximately ten other Black Widows are converging on them after having easily spotted them and kept up. But I guess we don't worry about that because this is a moment. So, they get to Yelena's bike, and honestly, I'm glad we can finally calm down from all that stupid shit. <laughs> An APC? They have an APC? It's literally fucking tearing buildings apart and smashing cars away in an attempt to move down the street. It would have crashed through the entire city to get to their bike. What the fuck? If you knew they were here, or that the bike was here, why weren't people stationed already? Why wasn't there a bomb on the bike? This was the east side of the apartment building. There were people outside it on the ground floor. Where the fuck did they go? Why not send someone on foot? How didn't someone make it here on foot before the APC did? did. Drakov, why send a fucking surprise birthday APC, you goblin? How do you propose it's going to follow them the second they make a fucking turn? How is it going to evade the Hungarian authorities? How is- why the f- why? Oh, they literally did a turn and it can't follow them. It's like a fucking video game. And look, this unsuspecting bystander now pays the price. That guy's probably dead. Good job. Seriously though, no luck, thought, or tear shed for that Randy. You love to see it in your heroes. And you know what? I'm actually pretty unclear on what this guy was doing there. He looks as if he suddenly stops upon seeing the APC and the bike, but where was he heading? This doesn't look like it's built for vans to drive down, nor did it look like he was driving down it. Was he trying to kill himself? Can he even avoid the signs? Was he literally teleported in to simply force them down a path they could have chosen to go down regardless? Fucking hell. If we can rewind though, you gotta see this. The APC arrives, and we're all shocked and everything, but 
it stops. It stops for a while. We see Black Widow and her sister prep the bike, move it into position, and finally leave, with the APC only beginning to chase. This whole scene is bizarre. Fucker could have plowed right into them and nobody would have been able to do shit about it. Unfortunately, however, the action isn't over. We see a Black Widow chasing our heroes to the point of ramping up this car, and... <laughs> Yes, the invisible ramp across the whole car made that possible. While this is happening, our heroes drift into a wall, slam across it, propel themselves over the gap and onto the preceding road to immediately get up and continue their journey by stealing a car as if nothing happened. Look at this. The fuck are you two made of? The Black Widow was right behind them, by the way, and they don't seem to catch up because a train happened to get in front. Or, well, they do, but both Natasha and Yelena have made it inside and started driving away. The Widow even sprays a machine gun across the sunroof and misses both occupants entirely because of course. Luck is simply what we have on the menu, boys. The chase continues and they refuse to shoot the wheels out of our hero's car, naturally, because the chase would be over. Instead, they choose to essentially tear the windows apart with bullets while carefully avoiding any damage to either Yelena or Natasha. Yelena then suddenly yanks the wheel of the car and lucky for her, Natasha breaks in such a way that a perfect drift is achieved and the car is turned to the exact angle Yelena needed. Do not try this at home, kids. It don't fucking work this way. Unless both of you are extremely talented at driving a car and you're using the same damn brain. Regardless, it is indeed timed so perfectly that opening the door to the car snaps off its hinges from another structure, hitting it directly into the bike chasing them, knocking her off their trail. I don't know, my brain just like caught up with all the stupid that was happening. Why does the door hit that pole and then fly backwards? I... Oh, it should just fall on the ground. Why would it fly the fall other the way? Ground. When you you're, open you're the door the and you hit the pole, it will break off, but it will just fall down. Or alternatively, it will slow it down, but keep going the same pole. way as the car. But what happened here is that it hit the pole and then it flew in the other direction. It's like they want us to think it springs or something. Yeah, yeah. but it wouldn't. It, it would just, just fall just down. And keep... If you ignore the car for a moment, they want us to think the door <laughs> flew into the pole and bounced back off it in the other direction, like it full yeah. speed. That's what they want us to think happened. Yeah. It's not a spin. <laughs> it would just, just rip the think. door off. It's cool. It's the layers of stupid. Of course it dealt significant damage to her, but it is fine. Nobody gives a shit. At least this scene is finally over. <laughs> Oh my god, surprise birthday APC again. Man, I used to think Budapest had authorities. Anyway, I think this will cause zero issues for the APC and every Black Widow in the area. Nobody has smartphones. And look, the driver is Skull, fucker, looking to fire off another explosive arrow. This time, I'ma just let you appreciate it. Death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. You died from whiplash, the crumpled car digging into your legs and head, shock, trauma, internal bleeding, and just about every other thing in that moment. Neither of you are capable of significant movement right now, nor should you be attempting it. Just look at the number of people in and around this subway. Fucking phenomenally lucky that none of them were on the staircase ready to be splattered. But. I mean, nothing matters, everything is nothing, explosions are like butterflies, and off they go. After managing to outpace Cringe Master, despite the car wreck, a shield is tossed and it embeds into a fucking steel beam, meaning that this thing could have cracked right through a window frame with ease. And it makes you wonder what it's made of, but whatever. They manage to make it out because Master Craster is stuck in slow-mo again. By the time they've found a good hiding spot, the snail shows up and thinks they've hidden somewhere else. You see, they left blood near the vent to imply that's where they went, but exactly how did you get up there without leaving a drop of blood? This was all done in a rush, and with the capabilities we've seen in that mask, along with the experience and training this creature has, I seriously doubt hiding in a vent meters away will stop this world-class assassin from spotting you, but I mean the story is over if they do, so fuck it. Oh, also Fudge Master left the shield behind 
the thing is sticking out of a steel beam in a train station that a car just crashed through. I'm sure none of this will be part of an investigation, and no one will be impeded throughout the plotline. Nat and Yelena then hide in a safe spot that Clint and Natasha hid in for two days during their mission, like... 10 years ago. You heard that right. The station they were blown into happens to be one with a hidey hole that Nat and Barton have used as much as a decade ago. The word convenient doesn't even cover it. Speaking of, if there are any traffic cameras or security coverage for the buildings in general, Natasha's fucked. You don't need Ross to identify the fact that the Black Widow is blasting through Budapest, which is especially hilarious considering the nature of her current wanted status. Not only will this be added to her record, it gives Ross and any other Avengers is currently tasked with him a hell of a lot of leads in finding her. Even her decision to enter the vent will be on a camera. Oh look, a game of tic-tac-toe they played years ago. Wait, what? Why have you drawn the line down when you have three across? Wait, how did you put down every circle without trying to stop the crosses player whatsoever? They landed a full line twice? Did you just come on set and drop random X's and O's with a line to try and come across as though a human might have played this? Why the fuck didn't you just play a game of tic-tac-toe for real. How do you fuck up tic-tac-toe, you gnome? They somehow then escape every last person attempting to follow them, and since we have no explanation on how they were found in the first place, I have no idea if they are in danger of being followed. I also have no idea how they got so lucky as to have their car flip all the way down into a fucking subway entrance, when had they simply landed, they'd be shot by another explosive arrow. What I do know, however, is the location of the Red Room. Red Room He's still active. Where is it? He moves location constantly. And every widow is sedated on entry and exit for maximum security. It constantly moves and not even a black widow can find it that currently works for Drakov? Then how in the holy haberdashery of fucks did you think Captain America would find it after simply providing him a batch of fucking floob juice? Where is the logic, you blonde brick? I'm finding it hard to believe that he could stay off my radar. I mean, the clue is in the name. Drakov kills you. One of the big ones comes to avenge you. So, Drakov didn't kill Natasha despite her defection, her attempt on his life, and the knowledge she possesses because it would have made the Avengers come after him. Mm-hmm, yes, that floor is indeed made out of floor, but you do understand the Avengers weren't created until 2012, right? She defected many years prior to that, meaning Drakov had all the time between his attempted murder and 2012 to kill her, yet he decided not to and they haven't managed to provide any reasoning for that. Not to mention that he's more than happy to hunt her down right now. And you might be thinking, ah, but Mauler, she's no longer a member of the Avengers, so there's no worry for him there. Well, that's where you're wrong, kiddo. Drakov is excited to get his hands on Natasha, specifically because he believes she's still a full member of the Avengers. Through her, he can have someone from within under his control. So that's two good reasons why he shouldn't be killing her. I could have assumed that he didn't want to kill her, a bit of a stretch, yes, but you know, a stretch is better than a hole, and they just punctured the script themselves. Twice. Excellent. Though it is now time to ask a very fucking obvious question. From the opening, it's clear that Natasha cares about her not sister quite deeply. She even pushes back on the idea that she would go to the Red Room as she did. That she should be spared. So you have to wonder, why was family-oriented Natasha Romanov of the MCU that we're all so familiar with happy to ignore this sister of hers until now? Not to mention all of the other Black Widows. Especially when she had the Avengers at her disposal. One explanation for this kind of hole in the writing is that Yelena didn't actually exist until they made this movie. But let's be more charitable and listen to the movie explain it. I thought that you got out and were living a normal life. What the fuck? You think it's an acceptable explanation that Natasha let her beloved sister rot in the Red Room along with countless others being fully influenced to continue missions under mind control to assassinate innocent people for a madman who wants to take over the world because she assumed they got out? We even have Yelena asking why she never made contact since that's a pretty fucking retarded assumption to make and the response? And you just never made contact again? Honestly, I thought you didn't want to see me. Oh. 
Well, okay. Glad you cared enough to spare a thought at this fucking point. We're gonna talk about this more, but this kind of damage seeps through every single iteration of this character. Retconning her story like this will affect how you consume her story from the outset. This is a horrible addition. Yelena then mentions that the Avengers aren't Natasha's real family, and that when she does her hero poses, they look silly. You see, we have to get our dose of comedy and character, but I think they've forgotten that Natasha is currently wanted worldwide. This seems to be a public gas station. Can you guys at least pretend to give a shit for five seconds, please? This clerk is listening to all of this. You're mentioning Natasha, the Red Room, Black Widow, the Avengers. He is reaching for the phone right after you leave. Step one of life on the land. Change your appearance. And if you're gonna be attached to me, you're going blonde too. Why the fuck does Daffy Duck have a stronger grasp on espionage than Black Fucking Widow? And maybe you're thinking this is ridiculous. How could they possibly be joking around while being hunted to death by an army of Black Widows after reuniting over their shared history of torture, indoctrination, and mind control after having been torn from each other at an early age? Especially when the joke is that she's watched her on TV to find this out keeping an eye on her despite having been ditched. Not to mention knowing all of that but not knowing that she's currently wanted, which would change the plot entirely. Why do we get this aborted mix of tones that cripple each side? Well, because it's Marvel and they literally have joke mandates, fucking joke ratio requirements. I hope it was worth it. This, this thing that you do when you whip your hair when you're fighting with the arm and the hair and you do like a fighting pose. <laughs> Such a poser. That was disgusting. Now let's switch back because Yelena has missed a social cue while also being a person who was mind controlled for decades yet loves to banter or whatever. Something we're definitely going to talk about. I was trying to actually do something good to make up for all the pain and suffering that we caused. Make up for all the pain and suffering? Oi! Dumb fuck. How about saving your sister? How about saving all of the Black Widows? How about finding and destroying the Red Room? This short but useful list might just make up for all that pain and suffering. Actually, why is it that you thought the Red Room was gone again? Taking down the Red Room? What are you talking about? It's been gone for years. Drakehog's dead. I killed him. So, Black Widow believes the Red Room is gone because Drakov is dead. She has nothing else to go on, as though killing the Emperor gets rid of the Death Star. You absolute fucking sock. And somehow, Drakov managed to convince the entire world he was dead. Not only is that pretty damn hard to pull off for both forensic and logistic reasons, this is incredibly difficult for a man as embedded in politics and industry as Drakov seems to be. I have trouble figuring out why he did it at all. He apparently had many strong political connections and ran his entire organization both officially and under the table for his crazy army of Black Widows. So why would he want to appear dead? Was it to trick Natasha specifically? No one's even looking for him thanks to you and Alexei. I have no fucking clue what's going on. But I think they want us to think that he took the opportunity to appear dead as a benefit to run his organization. Either way, this scene has done massive damage to Nat's intelligence and core values, and it doesn't stop there. We cut to the sisters, chilling, outside, at a table with the vials just displayed in a bag while on the run from an army of world-class assassins and while wanted by the United States. <sighs> excellent stuff. Yelena lets us know that the floomp juice was made by an older generation of Black Widows. When Natasha entered the system, it was psychological manipulation, but when she left, Black Widows were simply being mind controlled with chemical manipulation. Keep that in mind, we're not done with it yet. Natasha then lets us know that she never searched for her birth parents because her birth mother left her in the street. This is said extremely fast and very casually. No mention of a father and no way to confirm if it was true, especially when there's obvious benefits for Drakov to simply claim it's true. Natasha would know this. Regardless, she makes it clear there is no desire to meet this woman, which is interesting for a character that is so focused on the ideas of family, that she wouldn't want to confirm this information
information herself. The girls decide they have to take down Drakov together, and the only person they figure can help them is their not-father, Alexei, and so they will need to break him out of prison. They believe he knows where the Red Room is, and he should be able to help them get there. How are they going to do this, you ask? Well, they need something like a Quinjet, I suppose, so they ask the handler for one, and he gets them a helicopter instead, being that he is strained for resources, of course, and he's not a tech vending machine. He just seems so incredibly useful and does the kind of things Ross would surely have picked up on already. Secretary Ross has been sniffing around my affairs to the point to which I've got contacts declining my calls. I'm a private contractor. Oh, well, pointing out the problem is just as good as not doing anything about it, I suppose. Now they have a helicopter. That was easy. Alexei is currently committed to arm wrestling everyone in prison while getting a tattoo and telling everyone a story about his victory over Captain America during the 80s. Now, for you script writers out there, this is fantastic work. We know that Cap was frozen in the 40s and came back in the 2010s, meaning Alexei must be telling a lie to impress those around him. His tattoo being created while talking about this and banging around a table arm wrestling shows us that he is strong and full of pride related to how he is perceived. And finally, he is taking on many people all in a row. It shows just how powerful he is. Excellent. But, for the better scriptwriters out there, this is hideous work. Steve Rogers being frozen and thus out of the game in the 40s was well known. His return to heroism was understood by the public as late as 2012. Alexei may likely have already been in prison by the time he would have heard of Captain America's return. Regardless, Cap was not seen for 70 years. Do you understand how fucking long that is? That's not just some white lie. That's a story nobody would make up because it's nonsensical. In the 80s, Cap was about as well known as any wartime story in this universe. Many probably weren't even sure if the real life guy had any super strength at all. Alexei would instead talk about having taken on Thor, a man who's existed for more than a thousand years. It would have taken place in some distant battle on Earth no one heard about. Or hell, bloody Captain Marvel would have made more sense. You fought her and won well before she was seen in the 90s. It's not like people can prove that wrong with common knowledge. Claiming to have beaten Cap in a time period that everyone knows he wasn't in because Alexei is stupid is like saying someone mistook their house for many hands because stupid. Stupidity doesn't explain this. This is simply a lie he wouldn't tell. And no, I don't think he was talking about Isaiah. The Red Guardian may be a moron, but I think he can tell the difference between those two. Most people excuse this because they're both super soldiers. As if that's the only connection required to have him say all of this stupid shit. Then you have the tattoo. If anyone has as many tattoos as this man, they know very well that you do not get them while moving around and slamming desks while while shouting. Not only is it painful when they go deeper than intended, and believe me he still feels pain, the image is guaranteed to be compromised. You'd have to be incredibly stupid on the side of the tattoo artist and completely oblivious on the side of Alexei. And then there's the arm wrestling. It makes him look so strong and impressive, right? But why would hundreds of big burly dudes be lining up to arm wrestle the Red Guardian? The man is known for having the strength equivalent to a fucking train. Why? Have after watching him dismantle man after man with superhuman strength in a world filled with crazy fantasy sci-fi powers, would you even bother signing up to be beaten by him? All you achieve is the potential loss of your hand. Yeah, well done. So that's a really shitty introduction, let's see what happens next. Do I? Okay, so the guards of this prison provide Alexei with his fan mail. Apparently he is popular enough to not only have fans, but figurines made of him as the Red Guardian. Furthermore, the guards fuck with all of his stuff, eating the food that was sent and toying with everything that comes in. They still provide this figurine to him, which I think is lucky as fuck on its own when you would want to keep the Red Guardian as secure as possible. Providing any kind of plastic and metal to prisoners is a huge mistake, but he was simply that lucky. We then find out that when you pull the figure's string, its head pops off and provides a receiver for communications with Black Widow and Yelena. You heard that correctly. Had the guards pulled the string on the figurine themselves, as you would expect anyone to do when checking prisoner gifts from the outside world, the entire plan fails. Anyway, let's go over the breakout in bullet point form. Then I'll say what the fuck and break down how this was written by a shoe. Natasha hacks into the prison security and opens gate one. Not Hellboy beats up these two guards 
nods and walks through gate one. He then walks through what seems to be a mess hall of sorts to a second gate. He walks through it as Natasha opens it. He is then surrounded by riot gear guards, only to push past them and lock them all behind him. He then kicks the main door open and enters the courtyard of the prison. Guards are not present until they magically appear and have guns. Black Widow then drops down and begins to beat up the guards. The guards then fire on the helicopter en masse, including a minigun. Yelena puts the helicopter on auto and fires an RPG back. The minigun is destroyed, but an avalanche begins, and the occupants of the prison begin to flee inside. Natasha swings around on the helicopter to pick up Alexei, and they escape. <laughs> What in the telly tubby fuck? Let's rewind this and talk about how much this film's enjoyment factor is built on the premise that your intellectual fortitude has crusted over, akin to that of a dead muffin. Natasha and Yelena looked like they were arriving at the prison regardless of whether the toy made it to Alexei. They were simply hoping the guards gave him the toy at exactly the right time, especially with their fuel restrictions. What if they never provided it? When handling prisoners, anything unknown of this regard guard being given to them is incredibly stupid, especially when dealing with someone as strong as Alexei. Imagine they waited a day, or they played with it themselves, or Alexei was in the shitter, solitary confinement, had a bad relationship with the guards, which he clearly does, or what if he was asleep? The entire plan fails if any of these perfectly reasonable scenarios plays out, but we got the lucky timeline where everything works out for the best. And so, moving on, how do they have the resources to hack into a maximum security prison? You fuckers are on the run with no one to support you outside of the vehicle simp. He struggled to provide you a normal helicopter. How in the world does he have the resources to simply hack any prison system? That's insane. How isn't the opening of these gates not noticed as out of order by the very guards surrounding each of them? How isn't the destruction of this booth and the potential deaths of these two guards not setting off alarms or being noticed by literally anyone? If any of these guards have a stun gun, or a regular fucking gun, Alexei is dead. Dead. Actually, how doesn't the fact that he broke through the first gate alert anyone when he shouldn't be able to do it at all? How is he not put down by the army of riot guards? Perhaps it's through incredible editing. I mean, seriously, guys, look at this cut. <laughs> Fucking hideous. And it's worth mentioning here that Alexei gets zapped after standing in the courtyard having no clue what's happening because Natasha didn't take one minute to simply explain to him what the plan even was. Had they explained it, he could have done this jump well before the guards even showed up. It's only after watching him waddle around for some time that they even give him an instruction. Go to the upper level. He's never going to make it. Get me closer. So, how does Black Widow not get annihilated immediately by any one of these fuckers turning on her and shooting? And if she's gone this far, why the hell isn't she using a gun? I hope none of you are going to make the argument that she doesn't want to kill anyone, because we're gonna have words in a minute. But seriously, what are you fuckers doing? Are you differently abled? How are you taking this long to realize that this very normal ass, non-gun wielding human is assaulting your prison right in front of you? And then, how does the hell he manage to endure being shot by a tsunami of bullets, not to mention a bloody minigun. Yelena sits here while a barrage of bullets narrowly scrapes past every inch of her. This is some monumental plot armor for the character, but even more so for the helicopter. That thing is going down. To finish up, Natasha couldn't possibly hold Alexei with one hand on a rope, and while a torrent of snow is crashing into her. They both died in the avalanche, and the helicopter is fucked as well. But ignoring that abominable action scene in terms of the details, something is dwarfed the rest of the phenomenal writing, and that is the thorough assassination of both Natasha Romanov and Yelena Roman Tomanomanomalov, or whatever the fuck they're going with. They just executed hundreds of people. They trapped guards in with their prisoners while destroying many sources of power and communication. They buried human beings under hundreds of feet of snow thanks to the use of an RPG in response to someone trying to prevent you chuckle fucks from facilitating the highly illegal and immoral escape of a convict. They will eat each other in there. The likelihood that anyone can muster a significant enough force to dig them all out of this enormous disaster in time, before many have died for a multitude of reasons, is incredibly unlikely. And if you think they deserve it because they're prisoners, 
prisoners, or because they are members of law enforcement, then you aren't mature enough to watch Postman fucking Pat. Thanks to these foul bints, everyone in that prison is about to have the worst few days of their lives. All because Yelena thinks Alexei might know where the Red Room is. As they leave, not a second thought is given to this atrocity. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. We're through the looking glass here, people. Marvel, or rather Hollywood, don't have a single moral bone in their gangly reptile bodies. They have no idea why doing any particular action is good or bad. They praise the downright demonic activity of their heroes while often shitting all over villains who attempt to find a way to neutralize the situation. You've taken an entire town hostage. Well, I'm not the one with the guns, director. Natasha and Yelena were killing those guards for trying to defend the prison, preventing a particularly powerful convict from escaping. They then killed hundreds of men via avalanche who were paying their debt to society along with the men set to guard them, and neither of them gave a single shit. Nor does the movie, because my goodness, wasn't it cool? Ha! This would be a cool way to die. <sighs> it's all so tiresome. Moving on, we discover that Alexei is the first and only Soviet super soldier of his kind. Which is amazing, right? First was Cap, a man made by someone's formula that cannot be recreated, making it impossible to generate more super soldiers, but he can act as a superhero regardless. Then we have Bucky Barnes, a super soldier created by someone's formula that cannot function on anyone else. He was the only one stable enough to maintain it, making it impossible to create more stable super soldiers. Then we have Isaiah, a man experimented on in secret who was created around the same time as Cap by someone we didn't know about but also couldn't replicate the procedure to generate more super soldiers, but that's definitely it. Oh, and nobody ever heard of Isaiah. Then we have the Flag Smashers, a big group of super soldiers created because some guy cracked the code that nobody knew about and then he died. Meaning there definitely won't be any more. That's the most. It stops there. Then we have the Red Guardian, a super soldier created by the Soviet Union who even had public praise and merchandise. How neat is that? Only it was something that couldn't be manufactured wide scale, it only worked on him, he's the only one for some reason, and nobody's heard about him, nor do they care. I, for one, look forward to seeing a Cold War era super soldier pop up from every single country. Only one, though. For reasons. I mean, it can only bolster the already stellar world building, right? General Dracov. My friend, huh? There is me in Ohio on that stupid mission. He is boring me to tears. Put me in prison for the rest of my life. He just runs off and hides, huh? So, apparently, from this whole scene, Drakov put Alexei in prison because he called the party a bunch of sourpusses. In addition, he may have been a suspect for the death of Drakov's daughter. Hopefully we get a scene where the two of them can explore that. It sounds important to Alexei's history, and he would of course hold quite the grudge. Regardless, in terms of plot, Alexei knows where Melina works, and he believes that she will know where the Red Room is because she still works for Drakov. It seems incredible incredibly lucky that he knows exactly where she currently works, and as for her working for Drakov, well, we'll come back to that. Before the scene closes out, Alexei says he is confused as to why Natasha and Yelena are upset at him, that he's done so much in terms of making them reach their full potential, so why would they be frustrated? He says this after listening to them explain not minutes ago that their sexual organs were essentially pulled out to prevent any chance of having children. This is something he apparently didn't know, and he decides he doesn't care, declaring happily that they've both scored a huge kill count. You probably remember Black Widow has already said in this movie that she's trying to make up for that very history of having killed so many people for Drakov. Your ledger is dripping. It's gushing red, and you think saving a man no more virtuous than yourself will change anything? This is a child of prayer. Pathetic! Yeah, it was pretty intense, while setting in place exactly what Natasha Romanov is all about. Lucky for us, it gets referenced here. Your ledgers must be dripping, just gushing red. I couldn't be more proud of you. 
Yeah. Another scene that was intensely important to this character's journey has been shat on for a joke. Thank you. Alexi also asks if Cap ever talks about him. We've already been over how much that makes no sense for him to reference, especially when almost every other Avenger would have had greater knowledge than Cap of Earth's history, obviously including the Red Guardian, but we've got to get that joke in. I don't know if anyone noticed, but David Harbour seems to exist in media as the guy everyone uses as a punching bag. Only in this film, it's both literal and figurative. Good boy, Alexi. Good boy. You named the pig after me? You don't see the resemblance? You smell really bad. And so they head to Rachel Weiss, the woman who has the information they need, who works for Drakov, the man who has cracked mind control and has the army of Black Widows at his disposal that could kill you all. They realize they don't have enough fuel to reach her, and so they simply hope they can, walking the rest of the way. I don't think we have enough fuel for St. Petersburg. No, we're good. We'll make it. Okay. Why the fuck didn't they bring extra fuel unless they actually thought they would just luck out and the red room would be right next to the prison? What the fuck, you goompy idiots? And why would you just believe the dumbass character when he tells you you can make it? He doesn't even know how much fuel you have. Regardless of that, however, can anyone spot a problem here? What makes our team of heroes think Melina is not going to kill them on sight? What makes them think Melina isn't mind-controlled? What makes them think her compound would be available to them rather than and controlled by Drakov. What makes them think Melina would be sympathetic to them? None of these questions are addressed or even raised, and it costs them. It's honestly incredible to watch my main characters just self-lobotomize in the face of any decision they have to make in the storyline. Regardless, we then see Melina is alerted on her iPad that our heroes are in the vicinity. In reaction to this, she corrals her pigs into a pen and reaches for a sniper rifle to then gun them down. Movie. What the fuck? Can you please just give me five minutes to recover from your rampantism? I don't know, like, I, I paused this ad and the word that's on the screen is tism. Why would they approach this place so nonchalantly when they've just established she works for Drakov and she could be mind controlled? Why wouldn't they expect her to kill them when she's already been described as the brains of Drakov's organization? Why wouldn't they expect a stronghold with multiple black widows after everything that's happened in this film? And then why would she choose to corral her pigs when she may very well be under attack? Why is her security system that of, oh no, People, and then she aims her gun. Should she not have a bird's nest or some form of protecting herself in any way? If these people had any intention of killing Melina, she'd be a fucking doornail. When they finally reach her and say hello, she ignores them for a good few minutes as they follow her inside, only for her to say, Welcome to my humble abode. Like, I'm not one to knock etiquette, but how fucking weird is that? Anyway, Melina explains that S.H.I.E.L.D., but no, actually Hydra, in Ohio during 95, had cracked the deconstruction of the basal ganglia. This gives them access to the will of their chosen victim. This research was compiled in conjunction with the Winter Soldier program. Alexei apparently burned all of this research except that which he copied. This allows the writers to say that Hydra didn't have access to mind control tech. Only the Russians under Drakov did. Only, some of this doesn't make sense, which means it's time for an MCU history lesson. When Hydra broke away from Germany in the 40s, it also labeled the Soviet Union as an enemy, meaning these two factions had nothing but contempt for each other. But if you paid attention to the timeline as stated in Captain America Winter Soldier, Arnim Zola grew Hydra inside S.H.I.E.L.D. in conjunction with controlling the Winter Soldier, a man who was also, according to Falcon and the Winter Soldier, deployed on Soviet missions. It would seem that the new and improved Hydra, along with the Soviet Union, used Bucky for missions of their preference. The Winter Soldier was apparently a 
Soviet Hydra weapon, but the Soviet Union was dissolved in late 1991, meaning the relationship between Drakov and Arnhem was likely complicated, but the movie wants us to believe that they not only severed the connection entirely, they became strong enemies to the point that the Red Guardian was sent to steal all of the mind control tech Hydra was developing in America, to then burn every last piece they had on file. But how could Hydra, who are entirely about world domination, have allowed every last piece of research related to unlocking complete mind control be destroyed by a man who arrived in America three years prior? How exactly did he have access to steal everything they had while destroying any and all copies? Why wouldn't this have been backed up fucking everywhere? We are talking about what is literally the most important invention they could possibly have. Technology that would have been used immediately for their political, militaristic, and scientific needs. I refuse to believe they stored all of this on one computer or one office that David fucking Harbour burned down. He is consistently portrayed to be a fucking moron. You want to convince me that via espionage he rose to the top ranks of Hydra in three years to then destroy everything and escape? She was the, the scientist, the strategist. I was the muscle. That's a major contrivance, but if it isn't so, Hydra wouldn't have needed Project Insight. They would simply have the entire world at their fingertips via mind control. This breaks the whole movie just a little bit. So, they stole that and brought it back to Drakov. Why hasn't he taken over the world exactly? We are shown that he meets with incredibly important people semi-regularly. How wouldn't he invite people of interest to his mansion or whatever and then have a private discussion in his basement where he essentially kidnaps them, mind controls them, and sends them back out, only to then repeat the process until all world leaders are taken. It's been over 30 years, why is it that he's only managed to take over a thousand agents and place them in parts of the world? Oh my god, this is exactly like Black Panther, by the way. Then there's the fact that the MCU just introduced a complete mind control. Again. You guys probably remember the Mind Stone mind control, but you may also remember the Scarlet Witch mind control. Control, but you may also remember the Winter Soldier brainwashing mind control. But then you may also remember the brainwashing mind control conditioning for Black Widows. Well, now we have super duper mind control for them too. Which, by the way, doesn't explain why Black Widow wasn't given this level of mind control. Why wouldn't it have been applied to Black Widows immediately? She was working for Drakov well into becoming an adult. Why is it that they only use the shitty mental suggestion stuff? <sighs> Every bloody story adds some ridiculous new variable through significant retcons to the world and it absolutely cannot be sustained. Please don't say that. It was real. You were my real mother. The closest thing I ever had to one. The best part of my life was fake. And none of you told me. So Yelena reads about her family being the only real thing in her life, which is awkward because her fake mother apparently created the very mind control thing that subjugated Yelena and many other innocent women throughout the world alongside a father that describes his time with the three of them as boring and lame. But most awkward is Natasha. You got out. Drakov made sure no one could escape. Are you gonna say anything? No. It would seem we have somewhat of an explanation for the lack of mind control being applied to Black Widows prior to Nat's defection, as well as an acknowledgement of her abandonment of Yelena. Unfortunately, this has been added with no more finesse than a coccycidal whale. They hadn't thought about the implications of a completely subjugated set of Black Widows from Nat's generation, raising the question of how the fuck did Nat escape it? And so they tried to solve it with some good old-fashioned rushed-in post-filming ADR. And you? You got out. Drakov made sure no one could escape. You can tell because the statements don't quite fit together and Yelena's mouth is barely moving on the second. Regardless, they are saying that Drakov didn't want anyone to escape after Nat left. That's a pretty piss poor excuse and it simply makes you wonder why he would have held on to mind control and not used it until one of his agents defected. Why not just use it anyway? Oh right, because then this story would be impossible. Excellent work. Moving forward, the family split into two groups. Yelena with Alexei and Melina with Natasha. Melina then explains that Natasha actually had a family. She was given away for money, but her mother regretted the decision and attempted to get her back. She was killed by Drakov to cover up anyone potentially reaching the Red Room. That's 
quite the fucking bombshell. Not only was it a lie that her birth mother left her in the street, there's a whole family attached to that mother and a desire to have their daughter back. Natasha has no idea what the conditions of her sale were, or whether there was force involved. But she does know her mother was killed for trying to find her. Normally the actions of one curious civilian wouldn't warrant an execution, but as I said, she was relentless. What does that mean? It's a fucking flying fortress that the governments of the world and Tony Stark and Doctor Strange haven't found. Not even the people who work there remember where it is. How could a randy Russian woman be a threat in terms of finding it? What exactly is she gonna do when you've established that black widows can't even tell where the Red Room is? You know what I think? I think it made no sense for that woman to be killed and the writers couldn't allow her to live because Nat would have found her and we can't fit that into our retarded prequel movie. Only we still have the problem of Nat choosing not to find her birth family, and there's nothing to account for that whatsoever. This is despite the fact we all know she would have looked into it. I've always found it best not to look into the past. And why'd you save this? Oh! Like, the photo album was just right next to you the whole time. What a microcosm. Just keep up the storytelling, lads. Also, thank fuck for the insert shot at the beginning. The two of them, I mean. Without them, I might not have been able to realize that this was a photo album from their original house. You'd think the photos would give it away, but yeah. So, Drakov's men then approach the building, since Melina called them, and they fire just about 16 tranquilizer darts into Alexei, who is standing right next to Yelena. Like, why not tranquilize her? She's right in the same spot. It's... Nah. You sure this amount of tranquilizer isn't gonna kill this guy, by the way? Well, we're gonna have to move on anyway. And sadly, we're at the famous third act. So let's stretch this out and condense it back in, because things are gonna get weird at this point. I'll explain it in full so that you understand how everything works, and then we can talk about how the kindergarten team who wrote this should at least finish a few more years of creative writing before being handed hundreds of millions of dollars. This is gonna take a while. God, it's all so depressing. So, the the plan is to deliberately get the entire family captured so that Melina, when with Drakov in his office, will reveal herself to be Natasha in disguise and kill Drakov after discovering everything she can about his plan to take over the world with Black Widow agents. Melina will be dressed as Natasha, and when she wakes up in her cell on the floating fortress, she will simply unlock the cell and free Alexei, who will be imprisoned alongside her on level zero because Natasha will request that they are moved there. Melina will then tell Yelena through a comms device that was slipped into her ear while she was unconscious to access a knife in her belt, preferably before getting surgery. Cut the brain out. Identify the weakness. Yelena will then cut herself free, kill the doctors, retrieve the vials, and detonate them in front of all the Black Widows, freeing them of their conditioning. Then Melina, after having broken out of her cell, will activate the landing protocol for the entire fortress, with the two sisters escaping the facility and maybe killing Drakov if the initial plan failed. Natasha will have activated her tracker to signal Ross to pick her up, leaving him to take Drakov into custody, assuming he wasn't killed. Everyone will be safe. Every Everyone will be happy. The end. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Mola, this doesn't make any fucking sense. How could the plan possibly go this way with every variable in play? And then I say, gentle viewer, what do you mean? And then you say, well, first of all, why wouldn't they be stripped down and provided jumpsuits? This would rid them of the knife they need, the transceiver they need, and any weapons Natasha ends up using. The plan would die instantly. Which, yeah, that's fair. That's one one way this falls apart. Well, okay, you then say, but what about applying mind control to the lot of them? That makes some sense, right? If you mind controlled Alexei after stripping him down, you'd have a huge asset on your team. It kinda makes you wonder why the fuck they didn't do that anyway. Why drop him in a prison? If you capture and mind control them all immediately, you win. So okay, that's two ways this falls apart. Well then, how about the fact they don't search any of them for technology? If you're not gonna strip them, you'd at least search them for, oh, say, a knife? And if she lost that through even a fucking metal detector, or any soldier actually doing their job, then she's screwed and the plan fails. Now if Black Widow loses her transponder for Ross, the plan fails. Had they spotted the comms device they used to speak to each other, you guessed it, the plan fails. The funniest part to me is 
is that they could have told Yelena the plan ahead of time. They could even tell her from the moment they were in the cells, but they just didn't. So okay, that's three ways this plan falls apart. How did you do that? I designed these cells myself. When Melina simply announces that she's able to break herself and Alexei out of the cells because she designed them, is she aware of how hilariously stupid that is? If I build a steel cage with a padlock, my having built it does not mean I can simply leave it. How could there possibly be a failsafe inside these cells that allow you to open them? Did the people who built these simply allow them to exist? Had they placed security on this cell that wasn't breached simply because she made it, or placed her in a different holding pen, or had her executed or mind controlled, the entire plan fails. So okay, that's four ways this falls apart. Moving on to five, they tell Yelena about the knife in her pocket right before she's about to be, uh, given surgery. This is in conjunction with the reveal having happened with Natasha in Drakov's office. Had she decided to do what a normal person would do and simply help Yelena by telling her the plan immediately, they wouldn't be as much of an issue. However, with how long she took to tell her, she could very well have been killed. Saving her life here was done so clumsily that she could easily have been lost to them several times over. Speaking of which, had the doctors put metal restraints on Yelena, or had they put strap restraints that prevent her from moving her hands effectively, like any fucking non-wombo-brained individual would, she would have been killed, and the story ends again. So okay, that's six ways this falls apart. When they escape their cells as Yelena escapes from her hospital bed and kills two doctors, no alarms are raised. This is despite several unconfirmed breaches and doctors being free to pull alarms of any kind for a good handful of seconds. It's also amazing that nobody witnesses any of this. No cameras and no people are set off. It seems super lucky and there had to be systems like this in place. They could have been locked down in their respective rooms immediately. So okay, seven ways. And I can't really tell you how much more it falls apart without explaining what happens next. Natasha is pretending to be Melina, as Drakov, who really is played by Ray fucking Winston, by the way, is explaining his plans and ideas. Can you imagine what I could do with an Avenger under my control? Yeah, imagine that. Imagine having an Avenger under your control, something you could have done fucking years ago by having an on-call set of Black Widows to subdue and inject any of the Avengers at any time you prefer. If any of them should fail, you simply kill them. Hell, Cap wouldn't be able to put up with this level of tranquilizer, especially if the guy who can do this can't stay awake. But oh well. Welcome home. Oh, for good fucking goddamn sake. Where were these masks in the entire movie? And if you have now proven that Natasha switched places with Melina, then he should know that she is defected. Meaning he would now put everyone on high alert and they haven't even broken out of the cells they were in yet. If he performed any kind of lockdown and sent everyone to the front of those cells, the plan ends. So okay, eight ways. Welcome home. You motherfucker, you had a gun the whole time. Where the fuck were- what? Fuck you. Now you might be asking what Melina is up to ultimately, because of course she won't be in Drakov's office. The answer is that she's going to access the landing protocol and force a set down of the Red Room. The reason she has this chance is because Natasha, as Melina, requested that they be locked up together, specifically on level zero. Zero being near that very set of controls. But what if they literally said, fuck off, we're going to arrest them the way we want to? What if they placed them on any other floor, and what if you two weren't together so Alexei couldn't be freed and thus delay task fucker when it all goes down. And so, why in the flim flam fuck would Melina not teach them all how to escape these cells? If anything should go wrong, for any reason, then you have plenty of backup plans. In fact, why the fuck didn't they actually use their own faces instead of switching them? It doesn't give the game away as quickly. And if you then get Alexei to break out of his room, get to Drakov's office and kill him, Drakov would be dead. Remember, Alexi isn't affected by the... <laughs> you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's nine ways this falls apart, and seriously, that number is conservative when considering how much we've been over. 
So, uh, that little girl who was leveled along with a five-story building, she survived. And now that's her, she's Taskmaster. Olga Kurilenko plays this character, and since her body is that of a stick, I'm not sure if they just CGI'd her head on top of a guy's body, or they have her wearing an absurd muscle suit. It's so weird to watch, but it's rare that she takes off the helmet, so whatever. Let's just see what they do with the character. You want to tell her you're sorry? Well, you should have thought of that before you blew her face off. This means Natasha never actually killed Drakov's daughter. She scarred her face, but man, that is quite a bit of red you just expunged from the ledger. Then again, it's weird because Drakov makes it seem as though he had to save her by putting a chip in her neck or something. The idea was that she did heinous things, horrible things, under both the control of Drakov and in an attempt to defect. But you just undid one of the consequences to a significant degree, presumably to protect Natasha's character because writers these days just don't have the balls. The thing is, she still blew a cornea off this woman's face, and having an all-is-forgiven attitude would be fucking absurd, but I don't know why I would expect anything else. Equally absurd is the idea that Natasha decided there was no way to blow up Drakov other than using his daughter as bait. We know what Nat is capable of. Nobody buys, especially with the target being a guy in a building, that this was her only option, making the situation a lot worse for her character character in a different way. After discussing this reveal for a few minutes, Drakov sends Flabsmacker down to level zero to deal with the escaped prisoners, meaning he had some level of knowledge that this was worth prepping for. But what if his only soldier isn't enough to stop them? Or rather, what if they aren't stopped in time? And think of what they can do with the time they have. <laughs> Again, he should have put the entire base on full alert the second he knew this was Natasha and not Melina. But fine, we can just add another significant fuck up to the list. For anyone who gives a shit, that's ten. Drakov's men are now actively searching for both Melina and Yelena, despite the fact that they could have been subdued as early as their arrival. Melina actually manages to get to the consoles for landing the ship, but she is shocked as Drakov locks her in the room and disables the controls. Apparently he knew she would go there, and he had this planned? Which, why let her get in there in the first place, you fucking pantry? And then she opens a vent to simply escape the room immediately. I don't fucking understand. Yelena, on the other hand, goes and collects the vials in storage, ready to deploy them on the Black Widows. Drakov didn't have these destroyed, or under intense security? You'd think he would, since they have the power to destroy his entire organization. This is the only amount of them, as far as these characters know and Drakov has an explicit hatred for this antidote in general. These are gases and uh, antidotes. It's a uh, pain in my ass. You know what? That's 11 fucking ways this falls apart. Regardless, Natasha then says Drakov is a pathetic little man with no real influence, and so he gets extremely upset. Oh, stop it! Don't tell me to stop! <laughs> <laughs> And if you're wondering why in the world she would say any of this, and why in the world it would anger Drakov, well... The movie thinks it's very cleverly getting Natasha to make him reveal everything he knows through deception. In this case, taking hits while pretending to mock him without revealing her ulterior motive. She's about to get him to reveal his world domination plans. But Mauler, you say? That makes no sense. What does he have to gain from this? Well, his pride, obviously. He feels hurt by her mean words. I don't need to impress you. I don't need to impress anyone. These world leaders, these great men, they answer to me and my widows. It's my network of widows that help me control the scales of power. <sighs> yeah, the guy has headed the most secret and impressive mind control operation in the history of mankind, but can't handle his blood pressure when Natasha says he's pathetic. Amazing. So Drakov accesses his main console by showing Natasha it's done with his ring being swept across the panel here. He then explains that behind every powerful man in the world there is a girl, and he has control of hundreds and hundreds of girls worldwide. And then he says this. And with you, 
An Avenger under my control. Um, have you not been watching the news, you fucking cheese golem? She's not on the team anymore. She's wanted for breaching the Sokovia Accords. She's going to jail at best. She is literally at her most useless to you right now. I can finally come out of the shadows, using the only natural resource that the, the world has too much of. Girls. What? You're going to dominate the world with your Black Widows while killing 19 for every 20 trained because the world has too many girls. Uh, are you trying to make a sexist villain, but you don't know how to write one, so he just said there's too many girls? Like, how inept does your writing have to be? To clarify, Drakov's plan is to use mind control to take over thousands of girls in the world who will then influence anything and everything he wants in all parts of the world politically. This allows him to essentially sort of control the world, possibly? You'd think that since this has been a plan for some time, and that he's had access to mind control for a significant amount of time, he would simply need to mind control people in any positions of power and work his way up. Eventually, he'd get a meeting with, oh, I don't know, the president? He can then gas him and his men in a private meeting and do the mind control tisms rinse and repeat for the whole world, and yeah, everything now works for you, I guess. Regardless of the particulars in the execution here, Drakov has won. He just said he's ready to deploy, meaning these thousands of women are all trained and ready to take over their respective parts of the world. Our heroes defeated and the free will of the world at Drakov's fingertips. Or Kang's, I guess. But there's one thing Drakov didn't count on. What are you going to do? Sever the nerve. No, 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 no. Okay, let me explain. I swear to God, this is going to make all the men squeam. Though I do honestly think the context I provide is only going to make things worse, but... Let's give it a shot. The big subversion being run by Drakov in this big old boss battle is that no Black Widow can attack him because if they smell him, they are mind controlled into not hurting him. Like, they can kill him at a distance, but if they get close, they will smell him and then they can't kill him. His pungent aura protects him from Black Widows. No, I'm serious. This is the movie. You aren't allowed to smell him if you want to kill him. Hence, using Alexi to kill him, but never mind. So, Natasha came up with a plan on the advice of Melina. She will enter the room and avoid his big smells. Yeah, okay, you don't believe me. So here's the clip. I'll just hold my breath. To block receptors in olfactory center, you have to sever the nerve. You see? So if she holds her breath, she won't be stopped by his English-Russian odors. But Melina says his smells are too powerful, and they would override Natasha's attempt to try and hold her breath. So she must try a different solution. As a result, they come up with the idea for Natasha to break her own face across the table, severing her olfactory nerves, making it so his large essence can't get to her brain, and thus she can kill him. And so now you can fully understand the context for what is one of my favorite moments in comic book adapted cinematic history. <laughs> Seriously, I had no idea how to tell you this was the way she beats the big bad boss without coming across as a liar. Why would anyone believe this is what happened? She can't kill him because of his fearsome stench. As luck would have it, however, she planned to fucking punt herself headfirst into a desk. Welcome to Black Widow, the MCU at an all-time high. What are you going to do? <laughs> So, let's talk about this. Why the fuck would you install a smell sensory protection system via the brain of a Black Widow instead of sight, sound, or hell? You should have just mind-controlled Natasha in the early days to begin with. And then, why is this the plan? Why in the world wouldn't you try and execute him from far away? Or use some kind of high-tech gas mask? Or have Melina do some kind of neural lock thing to prevent it? I mean this from both a meta and character standpoint, by the way. In addition, 
Captain, if Natasha is genuinely severing the olfactory nerves, I need to let you know that the force in which you'd have to bring down on your skull to make the brain rattle around enough to crush the olfactory nerves against the skull is quite significant. This is so incredibly dangerous that I would have assumed you wanted to knock yourself the fuck out, if not die. You can, at the very least, give a potentially confident goodbye to your sense of smell. <laughs> All of this absolute gobshite is sitting pretty with just about every other writing flaw in this film, working hard to amuse and frustrate me, but we do indeed end up with one more question. What if I told you guys the plan is incomplete? You see, it was Natasha that essentially convinced Melina to defect after referencing all of the family stuff, only it was too late. I'm sorry I wore the alert at the Red Room and I'll be here any minute. Melina is the one that essentially forced them to be a part of this plan by having called the bad guys already. Only she changed her mind after one conversation. Now think about this. She told Natasha you have to give everyone up, place your sister into the hands of the enemy, put myself and your not father into prison cells, and then reveal to Drakov that you are Natasha, and when the time is right, you can kill him by breaking your face across a desk so hard that you separate the nerves from your fucking brain. Sources? Dude, trust me. Your not mother, who literally just sold you out, is telling you to give everyone up and essentially kill yourself. You went along with this plan, hook, line, and sinker. You are not Natasha Romanov. You're a fucking moron. You're incredibly lucky this all worked out, and you deserve this as the act you must engage with to win a fight. But yeah, all of that is just another way the entire story falls apart. We're on 12 with that, by the way. Though that is clearly fucking reduced at this point. Drakov then summons his army of Black Widows via the iPad with a palm to the screen. Natasha simply couldn't stop him. And it makes me wonder what would have happened had he needed more than one touch to activate his army, like any normal piece of technology. Oh, well, that would fuck up the plotline again. Melina is then spotted by many guards who choose not to shoot her despite her significant defection. She casually walks around until firing a grenade into the ceiling, fucking up the propulsion, crashing the entire fortress down. <laughs> This motherfucker. She just exploded the facility and told the team it's coming down. She's got no plan and she only cares to get herself out of there. Well, and Alexi, her bodyguard. This is gonna kill a shit ton of people. Plenty of innocent, mind-controlled people. It may even kill the people you care about. Well, are you convinced this woman is desperate to save the family she loves? I'm fucking not. Also, to be perfectly honest with you, they probably should have built this underground. But then you don't get all this shit in the trailer. And lucky as fuck she wasn't hit by the explosives or the guns they choose not to fire for reasons. This story is just so riveting. Again, and had Drakov not let them run around, none of this shit would be happening. Oh, I guess a boss fight goes down with Alexi and, um, Pissmaster. And you might be wondering, how in the fuck could Alexi lose? He seems on par, if not more powerful, than Captain America without even breaking a sweat. And we just found out that Shotcaster is basically just a Black Widow. No strength bonuses. This fight should be- oh, oh. How are you not able to take the punches from this clown? You're supposed to be a goddamn tank, dude. <laughs> You saw that correctly, folks. Tasky bashed around Alexi for about 10 minutes of movie time until the fight moved right into the open cell the moment Melina arrived. She booped Flap Fappa right into the locked cell, right before Alexi died. Fantastic. I'm assuming there's no control on that wrist thing for the cell here, nor is there a way for your literal top assassin in the organization to contact security and get released. No. Okay then. Lucky, I guess. With all that happening, Yelena grabs a flashbang to attach the vials to. She's hoping to blast them in front of the widows, but she has to find them first. She then deduces that they've all gone to Drakov's office. Somehow. Excellent. Meanwhile, Natasha is about to land the killing blow on the big smelly boss man with her ice pick. But this happens. <laughs> Wow, that's some crazy luck you've got there, sir. And good thing you didn't hit Natasha with anything lethal, because she'd be dead. And then the movie would be over. That's 13, 14, 15 right there, I don't even know. Nobody leaves this room. 
until she's dead, make her suffer. Man, this is gonna be over quick. They're all recently trained, younger, and working as a unit with ranged weaponry that can burn you to death. All they have to do is immediately shoot her in the legs or torso with those blaster things, and she's gonna be suffering all the way to death. Unless they all attack her in really stupid ways one by one, she's surely gonna lose. I suppose they might just... Y yeah, that's... Yeah, that's what happens. Right before they manage to kill Natasha, however, Yelena appears and throws the vials in, bathing the entire room in floomp juice. Yes, Yelena threw every single vial in, even though it takes far less than that to save all of the people in this room. Meaning, she just destroyed every vial and we can't replicate them anymore, you fucking blonde womble. Also, let me just summarize the damage taken by Black Widow in this scene. I think this movie has completely forgotten Natasha Romanov is a fucking human being. She's died in this movie so many times that I no longer think this fool should have done anything. Why exactly can't she take on Thanos? Regardless, the Widows are free and the sky is falling, so let's get the fuck out of here. The Black Widows escape in their own jet and Yelena goes for Drakov specifically. Meanwhile, Melina and Alexei ditch Flaskfucker and get to a jet themselves. Unfortunately for Drakov, he didn't realize Natasha stole his ring, remembered the swipe he used, knows how to access particular options and files, and uses a keycard that she somehow must have gotten through security to access his console. She then downloads every single name and profile for every single Black Widow. Melina could have made this device, I guess, in the time between needing it and the enemy team showing up. I would also say it's lucky that Drakov couldn't shut this function down remotely. In fact, it's amazing it still works when everything is blowing up, but whatever. Now they can all be found and freed from captivity. Think of it. An army of superheroes. That wasn't contrived out the ass at all. Speaking of such things, Natasha looks to the ground and spots two, count them two, vials of floomp juice. Incredible. Somehow they didn't explode when placed half an inch away from a fucking flashbang when every other one did. Gee, I hope they come in handy later, just like I hope Natasha needs exactly two vials to complete her mission, or I guess it doesn't matter because old Tasha gets engulfed in flames. just kidding. She flies out the window, immune to fire, and manages to free fall about 20 feet until grabbing a random bit of metal without breaking her arms, saving her from certain doom. Did I mention this movie has a little bit of that, um, a little bit of that, uh, the plot armor stuff in it? Pretty sure this movie is outclassing Fast and the Furious at this point. And if you don't believe me about that, well, the entire structure is literally being blown to pieces while set on fire, and she jumps back in. Now in fairness, I'm not saying it was a great idea to simply jump to the ground, so I suppose you would choose to do this even though it's pretty much a guaranteed death both ways. But something else happens, and I think you guys are going to find it incredibly funny. Yes, you saw correctly. Black Widow randomly bumped into fucking Fartcaster, the only person that is locked up that Natasha feels extreme guilt for. And so, she releases the prisoner, with knowledge she must have gotten from Melina, I guess? I know you're still there. And I'm not gonna leave you, okay? Hey. Hey, idiot. This person is under full mind control with a chip in her fucking neck. She is not going to be your friend, whether you release her or not. Before the Master of Tasks can execute Natasha, the plot decides to save her. Again. Only with this instance being that of breaking the foundations and sliding her to the outside of the fortress somehow. 
Listen, if a storyline is supposed to be a fucking line, all connected by cause and effect, then the only way to describe this story is as a particularly Parkinson's adult strand of spaghetti that's been pulled apart, melted, and stuck back together in alternative fucking dimensions. We are about to see there is no cause and effect to be found here. Anyway, Yelena has indeed somehow caught up to Drakov and his men as they attempt to escape. If you remember, Yelena arrived at the main office long after Drakov left. Not to mention the way to his ship was destroyed. This is what prevented him from retrieving his ring. So whatever way she managed to use to get to him is theoretically a way he could have used to get back, but he didn't. I guess Yelena knows Drakov's fortress better than Drakov. Or she teleported either way. At the same time, Melina and Alexei managed to escape on a jet right before the floor gives way and they managed to avoid every last piece of debris. Only... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for them, one of Drakov's goons manages to jump off the structure and shoot them as he falls to his death. This guy then lands on the fucking windscreen, staying embedded by having his foot smash through. <laughs> what is happening? Alexei perfectly tosses the shield he picked up earlier into the guard, forcing him to be hit into the back of the... I don't understand how the physics here work. The short version is that he falls and breaks the vertical tail fin, spinning their jet. Like, you can't make this up, this is just insane. But moving back to Natasha, as I said, she magically went from falling out of the base to jumping back into the actively crumbling base, to falling through the floor, to falling through the floor again. She then hangs on the outside, dangling over certain doom, to then have the plot fairies twist the entire structure over and drop her next to Drakov and Yelena. Absolutely incredible. The luck factor has left the universe. Like, how could you have this many instances all at once? The word phenomenal doesn't come close to quantum quantifying what cruel attempts at cause and effect we are witnessing today. And can I just say, I love the fact that this building is continuously exploding. Melina detonated one of the engines, and now random portions of the entire structure just explode at their convenience. Parts that have seemingly no connection to these centralized, immolated pieces suddenly find themselves hitting self-destruct. I mean, whatever the fucking audience wants, I guess. Only Natasha then realizes that her sister is about to make the ultimate sacrifice. She will plow her Black Widow stick spear thing into one of the engines of Drakov's jet to prevent it from lifting off, killing him in the process. This is admittedly pretty intense. It's not like if she had a gun or a single grenade that she could have killed all of them. Or I guess they should have killed her with ease by now, but it was already impossible for her to catch up logistically, so... Ugh. Instead, let's chat about the fact that they made it clear being in any way near Drakov means, as a widow, that you smell his stank juice. And if you smell that, you cannot act in any way that would harm him whatsoever. Like, yeah, it's breezy out here, but they told us a single sense from your olfactory nerves and you lock up. Not even blocking your nose or holding your breath can stop it. So this should simply be impossible. You can't have both. But far be it from me to point out contradictions in a story. Only big, weird, long nerds do that. So they should have spotted her a fucking mile off and shot her both before and during the escapade on the jet, but it's fucking unforgivable when Drakov himself is literally pointing it out for the duration. This fucking guy is just aiming at her and refusing to shoot. She's about to kill you all. What the hell does he pay you for? In fact, why didn't Drakov just step out? He's about to explode. All of them remain in the jet as they simply watch someone detonate it. Good god, this is just so very intense. Just appreciate how real that background looks when ScarJo gives that impassioned Kalel no. no! Okay, it's not as bad, but we're moving on. I would now like you to watch the results of these carefully placed pieces on the character chessboard enact their choices based purely on their values. Now this is cinema. <laughs> oh, did you see that jerk? <laughs> <sighs> like, she died from the shrapnel alone. <laughs> this, this, whole, this whole movie, man. <laughs> what 
What a fucking experience. What else can I say? The flames popped his glasses off for fuck's sake. A garbage death for a dumbass character. Goodbye, Harvey Weinstone. Fuck it. So Yelena is now free falling off the platform, and she's unconscious, meaning it's over. Natasha can't fly, so I guess she can't save her. What a shame. Unless... It's a random surprise birthday parachute. Thank you, writers. This is perfect for being able to save a friend as they fall through debris-addled sky doom. You see, it's not ridiculous for Natasha to have spawned one of these right in front of her when she needed it. It's not ridiculous that she so easily catches up with Yelena. It's not ridiculous that she falls inside a fucking falling jet plane and manages to reconfigure her falling pattern to line up with Yelena's. It's not ridiculous that neither of them are hit by any debris in a lethal way, both both before and after deploying the fucking parachute. But you know what? Part of this is just a little bit too bullshit. And that part is this. <laughs> <laughs> I wet my jockeys here. You gotta get a load of this, Skeet. I mean, you like comedies? Listen, okay, sometimes something happens in a movie, on top of all these other things, where you simply have to say, fuck it, we're in a clown movie now. Why don't you move that <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> That's really dumb. This is what we call a cloud movie. <laughs> this whole story absolutely qualifies as having sprayed its audience with pure, multi-dimensional clown gravy. Expecting us all to lap it the fuck up. Enjoy that gorgeous rainbow harlequin slime as it collects across this two-hour nightmare. As it creates an extremely rare sight in storytelling, expert scholars have studied this for decades. labeling it the mystical supernova of fiction, also known in select parts of the universe as the time a film converts itself into an event of complete and total clown singularity. Gaze upon the glory and despair. <laughs> So naturally, Tism Master has a parachute and engages it right before they both slam into the ground. This is probably the least significant form of plot armor in the entire movie, so let's just accept it. The funnier form of plot armor, however, is the realization that Natasha would have died had this idiot not tried to kill her. Just top-notch assassin strats. Natasha then still believes she can reach yeast plaster, despite obviously still being mind-controlled, but luckily for our hero, the villain is stuck in slow motion. Again. Like, seriously, what the fuck are you doing? They battle it out for a bit until Scrotum Sucker loses their super cool blade to Natasha, only for her to drop it and attempt another truce. Of course, that doesn't work because mind control. So once again, Natasha is forced to engage with the mirrored top-level skills of... AIDS master. Look, I'm running out of names, okay? They tangle up, and because Natasha saw it earlier, she opens up Melon Fucker's mask via her arm thingy, which you think would be biometrically locked or at least a little bit more fucking complex, but whatever. And then spots a hot damn rando surprise birthday party fucking victory floop juice vial on the ground right next to the fight that I guess fell out of her pocket and so smashes it and wins. We finally have our happily ever after. What a shit fucking final battle for our hero and villain. We got a blade that gets removed immediately, barely any use of any combat, and no mimicry. Natasha literally used this move in their first battle and received a counter. It works here because they clearly wanted to end this fucking production as soon as possible. You see, lucky for our heroes, the main wreckage fell a fucking mile away for some reason. After everything you've seen, I'm sure you understand gravity isn't very important in this world. The family collects back up. Every one of them is safe. Yes, 
course, the last we saw of these two was a spinning jet plane tumbling to its doom while surrounded by a fucking minefield of debris, but to be fair, she has a limp, so it's fine. Ross then arrives, and Natasha says they all need to leave while she sorts things out. If it can work out with the four of us, you know, there may be some hope for the Avengers. A little bit. Bruh, you're going to fucking jail. You assaulted the King of Wakanda and you breached the Accords. Ross is going to put you in the fucking raft. Actually, Ross is about to discover the remains of the entire Drakov organization. The hard drives are probably more than salvageable. Plenty of research and personnel will still be intact. Uh, wait, does that mean the UN now have mind control? Have we accidentally just handed all of that research, technology, schematic data, and history over to them? Granted, it's damaged, but this is 2016 and recovering data is very much streamlined now. Man, another significant blow to the world of the MCU. Before any of that happens, though, Natasha instructs Yelena to give the remaining vial to Melina. She can make copies of the formula to free the remaining widows worldwide with the information on the card they inserted. So yeah, had they not been lucky enough that two, count them any less than two vials made it through the flashbang and were noticed by Black Widow and weren't smashed in any of this shit and fell out of her pocket but didn't break, all of those widows would have been fucked. That's some next level luck once again, movie. You are excellent at this. So everyone escapes with the freed Black Widows who decided to return and save everyone while Natasha speaks to Ross. Just real lucky they decided to turn up and help. Would genuinely fuck the entire plot again had they not, but that's fine. Another way to fuck this is if Ross had even one air unit, which is exactly what he would have because how else would he have arrived here? so fast when we're in the middle of fucking Russia. But okay. So Natasha will speak to him, and we can see how in the world she's going to get out of this one. Cut to two weeks later. Two, for, two weeks later, we find that the vehicle simp has now provided a Quinjet to Natasha. She intends to use it to help Steve break the Avengers out of the raft in Civil War. Only they had a fucking Quinjet in that movie. They used it to get to Siberia, and then they used it to get to Wakanda before the movie closed out. Did, did you forget that? Also, uh, how did this guy get a goddamn Quinjet? They don't grow on trees for fuck's sake. But we can finally get to the question of how the fuck did Nat escape Ross? How isn't she in the raft? She had no resources and an army was there to pick her up. What happened? Why not just have her leave with the family? It would have made sense twice over, you clowny cunts. Speaking to the rap, Shortland addressed the omission. That was intentional because we wanted to leave the question of how she would get away rather than allow the audience to get exhausted by another fight, she said. We wanted to leave you guys on a high with the question of how did she use her ingenuity? Because she did. And it was probably, I would say, she bargained her way out of that situation, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mother f you don't know? Didn't you direct this crap? What the hell is happening? Oh, sweet Jesus, let this fucking end. I just can't take any more tism. It's a fucking over- Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. Not an after credit scene. Please, no. Come on, Fanny. <sighs> So it seems we've jumped past the events of Avengers Endgame, and Yelena is visiting Natasha's grave. Uh, why is it that the woman who gave her life to bring back half the universe got such a teeny gravesite? This thing would be a huge monument. The public would visit it daily. What the fuck ever. The grave reads, daughter, sister... Avenger, which means they must have awareness of Yelena from Natasha or Yelena herself, which means this moment can't happen. Maybe you'd like a shot at the man responsible for your sister's death. How could the Avengers be aware of Nat's history, and Yelena be aware of the Avengers' connection to Nat and their history, when she's being convinced that Hawkeye killed Natasha? That's not a thing. But even if that weren't the case, why would the nature of Natasha's sacrifice not be public record? Why wouldn't the Avengers have told the world how she died, with Hawkeye feeling nothing but survivor's guilt? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just here... Paying my respects. Oh, good God, lady. Nobody gives a fuck about the franchise you want to start. We're currently mourning the one that just died. Okay, 
let's all have a chat about that nightmare piss. For those who still have chronophobia, link them here. We're about to summarize this whole disaster. Disney's Marvel Studios Black Widow is a movie that wants to challenge the concept of cause and effect. It does this by presenting an impossible world, one that is incongruent with the setting other artists created that it chose as its foundation, as well as being unrecognizable when compared to the world we're all so familiar with. So let's start there. We are supposed to believe that along with everything else we knew about Hydra, the Soviets, and S.H.I.E.L.D., that Drakov subverted and destroyed a mind control research center with the Red Guardian. We are then supposed to believe that S.H.I.E.L.D., who were controlled by Hydra at the time, had Hawkeye try to take out Black Widow in Budapest. Only they then realized that with her they can take out Drakov. So they did. But they didn't look into any of his dealings or his operations. They would know he deliberately burned down their mind control research and stole it to develop something. And you want us to believe that not only Natasha, not only S.H.I.E.L.D., but all of Hydra decided to leave it alone. They didn't even clear the safe house. Hydra were happy to work on the Winter Soldier program, notorious for the subjects ignoring the will of their captors to the point of placing them on ice. But when faced with the opportunity to get their mind control research back, they stopped at killing Drakov and assuming the Red Room was destroyed. You then have to think that Hydra didn't manage to save any of their incredible world-changing tech beyond one area in 95, to then be unable to develop any of it again despite maintaining their personnel and having Robozola, who seems to have everything backed up on his servers from across the world of Hydra and S.H.I.E.L.D., which, by the way, they weren't using the acronym yet. Captain Marvel made this same mistake. And as if to add insult to injury, Alexi, the verified fucking mushroom brain, was the one who destroyed all of it. It was Alexi that caused Hydra to have their very much unreliable brainwashing we saw in Winter Soldier. So nobody is buying any of that. I do think it's funny, however, that the current continuity wants us to think that the Soviets were deeply involved in the Winter Soldier program, yet they left their empire-toppling super soldiers remain on ice, even when cracking foolproof mind control. The Soviet Union may have been dissolved, but Drakov would have had all the information he needed on those lads. An easy set of fantastic warriors at his disposal, and he let them rot until Zemo gave him the old shooty bang bang. Moving on, we're supposed to think that Drakov's plan since 95 or earlier was to develop an effective enough mind control that he could train and send his Black Widows to become high-ranking members of many different political, social, and militaristic hierarchies to then take over the world when he wishes, through them presumably being influential. However, the obvious question raises of why the fuck wouldn't he mind control the powerful people to begin with? You've had decades to play with. All you had to do was start small, and then mind control family members of family members of family members, one by one, tempting them all in gradually through each other, until you essentially take over the entire world with ease. There is no need for the Black Widow program. It's almost as though whoever wrote this tried to come up with a reason for the Black Widows to exist, and accidentally wrote world building that made them almost obsolete. According to Drakov, just one command and he can bring down the stock and oil market. You have to wonder why that's impressive when he could have had everything by now. Which leads me to then mention that there's no way in the flabbiest of fucks that the Red Room has been a secret this whole time. First of all, the engineering job required for this mechanical leviathan would metaphorically shake the fucking planet. The technology, manpower, monetary investments, and land needed for this thing to come close to creation would be phenomenal. Imagine the daily transfers of resources needed needed to feed the personnel and soldiers in his army. Its mere functionality as an enormous station that constantly moves requires that people would spot this thing with fucking ease. It wouldn't surprise me that S.H.I.E.L.D., Stark, Strange, or the governments of the world would come across it by accident with the extreme level of technology monitoring the entire world of the MCU. Look how many bloody lights are on for fuck's sake. Regardless, it was never seen nor discussed by anyone in any significant enough way 
way that got it on anyone's radar. I suppose it's always been too cloudy up there to see. But what should baffle everyone is Drakov's choice to pack what was probably a fucking solar system sized fortune into this thing when he could have achieved the same results with a standard volcano base, or a submarine base, or just a fucking basement. Had he chosen a large basement, the good guys would have lost the entire third act. It's impossibly hard not to look at Drakov as anything but an absolute moron for having built this thing. The entire structure was brought down by one engine failure from one grenade. The bloody helicarriers have a better flight system than this. Astounding. Which, funnily enough, is exactly how I would describe Drakov's apparent format for recruiting these girls. He, for as much as 50 years, collected girls worldwide, some through highly illegal money exchanges and some through standard kidnapping. He did this every day, with 19 dying for every one that is successfully trained. And he has as many as a thousand girls worldwide. Meaning, this man has potentially murdered 20,000 girls from everywhere in the world, and this is barely even addressed. He managed to get away with this for many decades despite dealing with all kinds of people all over the world, and with Natasha knowing this was very much potentially still in action, but not bothering to check. I get that we want to make him a super big bad guy, but who the fuck thought this collection of elements being unnoticed by everyone all over the world for the entirety of the MCU's crazy fucking history was a good idea, especially when we know there were several encounters with established powers. And really, the thing to bring him down was apparently a rogue Black Widow from Melina's generation synthesizing a gas that instantly removes mind control from the victim. How the fuck did you manage that? No wonder Drakov was so pissed that happened, it's bloody ridiculous. How are there rogue Black Widows that worked on a solution to the mind control exactly? How would they have any awareness of it without having it applied to them already? Melina seems to be the only exception because she created it. And then, how the fuck did they escape it? And what does that do to a person? Because despite this stuff being written by idiots, I still listen to what is said, and it's described as being conscious but not knowing what part is you. You are forced to kill innocent people while working for someone who simply wants to take over the world. This has to do some intense damage to your psyche, and 20 or so of these women are simply released on a whim near the end of the story. As much as it's entirely unethical, using the mind control to your advantage and having them enthusiastically help you save the day would have been the superior option. Imagine all of the horrific things that could have happened had this story properly represented what it was telling us. You would think you should free them once you've removed their weaponry in a controlled environment. Luckily for us, the characters are all incredibly well adjusted and save the day right after being provided their free will from years of subjugation, torture, and bloodshed. Well, as free will-ish as free will can be in this world. Of course it couldn't work any other way, as the plot would have died the moment we watch Yelena struggle not to lose her mind on the streets of Morocco as she comes to terms with her existence, only for her team to eventually arrive and execute her. And you know what? I've had some thoughts on what is essentially the world building of the collective that is the Black Widows. First would be the competence. Widows will attempt to stab people when a gun is the superior option in almost every case, not to mention refusing to use their stun or kill shots in these scenarios too. They will enthusiastically commit suicide when pursuing a target, they remain in complete exposure when on missions of any kind. The costume design is embarrassing. These fuckers shouldn't even have costumes when attempting to stay under the radar. They manage to get this right sometimes in MCU movies, but here, when trying to assault the apartment building, you see them posted outside in all black, rifles out, and fucking bullets on their collars. How the fuck does one have world-class espionage agents doing this with a straight face? Their battle plans are absurd, and even in great numbers they struggle to get a job done. There's no way the public aren't aware of these failed experiments, and there's no way a growing network of coverage on Black Widows wouldn't have generated. At the same time, their existence necessarily makes our Black Widow much less individual. If we include the fact that 
that she makes a myriad of mistakes in this story, having us wonder whether she suffers from cognitive flatulence, Natasha is not one of a kind. In fact, she's downright common. She just happened to break out of Drakov's grip before he implemented full mind control, which again makes you wonder how Morocco Black Widow broke out. Regardless, Natasha was then spared by Hawkeye, and she was given an opportunity that seemingly all Widows would have taken. Her moveset, fighting style, and combat efficiency is that of Black Widows in general, and after showing us that she's a simple cog in their machine, the story had the world-class assassins act like demented clowns. Ultimately, you can make the Widow stuff a general training thing if you want, but it not only makes her a dime a dozen, it creates a significant set of problems. <laughs> With the history we understand in this story, Natasha shouldn't be using Black Widow as her moniker. Why the fuck would she opt in for labeling herself the very thing she hated being raised as? Black Widows are feared assassins, and basically have zero control over their missions and executions, nor anything they do, really. I was originally more so under the impression that Black Widow was a codename that caught on. Instead, I am now wondering why the public weren't in an uproar when a crazy, dubious-as-fuck assassin was in the team that was saving the world. Why the fuck would Natasha want to be associated with them whatsoever? Not only would it cause emotional strain, as well as going against her goals of expunging that past, it's incredibly unwise to bind yourself to a set of people that covertly assassinate and destabilize that could only cause her problems in the future as Black Widows are revealed. By adding all of this, we've only created more issues. We all love to get more information on our beloved characters, but this has been very clumsy. Now, in terms of world building, how about we talk about the Red Guardian? A super soldier this world has no recollection of or reference to, despite having huge organizations run by specific individuals with interests in keeping an eye on potential threats or anomalies. He's a bona fide super soldier. Nobody wanted to look into where he came from, or what made him what he is, despite super soldiers being a huge element of many MCU plotlines. Not Erskine's successes, not Robo Bozola, not Hydra, not S.H.I.E.L.D., not Tony, nor Stephen Strange gave a single shit about this incredibly interesting anomaly in Russia. And to top it off, Drakov apparently couldn't replicate it. Natasha knew about Alexei for the entire time serving with Steve, and she never mentioned it. It's surprising to me that anyone would want to introduce any more mind control or super soldiers into this world, let alone an enormous faction with worldwide influence that is nuked in the same story it's introduced. But by gum, they they will try and look at the results. The world building was already severely damaged, but they've added significant fuel to that forest fire and all in the name of family. But what's real? His family. Which is interesting, right? It would seem this story is all about family. Perhaps in how we don't necessarily choose our family, or that family makes you stronger, or that you will always have a family, or that you shouldn't forget where you came from, or that you will always have a family to support you. These messages, of course, being drawn from the fact that Natasha is very family-oriented. We see more than enough to assume that that's what the core of the story is. Plenty of family imagery, plenty of references to what qualifies as a family and what doesn't. The only hitch being that the film seems to end with comically pointing out that Natasha went from having no family to the Avengers and the undercover family. It's funny, my whole life I didn't think I had any family. Turns out I got two. Ha ha ha, now she has two. Except that's not quite right, she has three. Her birth family may have given her up for a deal, but her mother searched for her and died doing so. Natasha doesn't have a single thought to share about the potential father, her blood sisters, her brothers, grandparents, etc. And neither does the story. And then her undercover family cause her nothing but problems. Yelena's delivery nearly killed her, to then lead her to being hunted by black widows. Oh, only to then kill hundreds of people to save the not father and be kidnapped after the not mother sold them out. This, all without contacting any Avengers about this potential end of the world, and all without the help of Steve Rogers and the Wakandans, people and factions who would be more than happy to assist when it's a matter of saving the world. They have resources at their disposal. It makes no fucking sense to raise the stakes this high and have no additional Avengers in the story. I just, if only 
only there was some kind of explanation. So, Pearson went on to explain that it was nearly impossible that Robert Downey Jr. would have been featured in a cameo in Black Widow. One of the main reasons that another Avenger was not featured in Black Widow was because the director wanted to make sure that Natasha was independent, fully in her power, without the need of any assistance, especially from a man. Black Widow director Kate Shortland had already stated that she and Kevin Feige agreed that it was important to show Natasha didn't need her male Avenger cohorts for support. Initially, there was discussions about everything, about all of the different characters, said Shortland. What we decided was, and I think Kevin was really great, he said, she doesn't need the boys. We didn't want it to feel like she needs the support. We want her to stand alone, and she does. What'd you bring me? You fucking morons. This is Natasha Romanov, not Plank. I don't even know who I am. Nat is defined by her investment in family. The Avengers are her family, whether the women help or the fucking men. You just, you go girled yourself out of telling the story most suited to the character. What a thematic fucking disaster. For a story that's trying to form some kind of message about the importance of family, it's fascinating to me that one family isn't even there for Natasha. One family causes her nothing but grief, and the birth family isn't even acknowledged. But still, it's all about family. A family that didn't show up in the entirety of the events of Infinity War and Endgame. Because of course Natasha wouldn't think a super soldier would be helpful. You're gonna turn your back on family? Part of what made her sacrifice so thoroughly meaningful in Endgame was that despite her goals of bringing the Avengers back together and repairing the family she helped create, she couldn't let Clint die, because he had a wife and kids to go back to. Her death would mean the family can come back together, and Barton wouldn't be taken away from his. But now you've established that Natasha had a birth family to go back to, that she apparently didn't bother doing fuck all with for more than five years because she didn't even know her birth father's name, and she of course had a real family of three undercover years that apparently love her to pieces on top of her Avengers family. The line between who had more to lose out of these two characters just became very blurry, and I don't think any of this was considered in the original Endgame scene. So, how did you fuck all of this up when it's the core of the character and the thematic throughline of the story? This stuff was easy, but I don't want to take away from the other thematic throughline. As others have pointed out, there is a strong overcurrent of slimy, disgusting men taking a advantage of young, innocent women in the film, forcing them to do their bidding. I mean, they must have hired Ray Winston for a reason, and it wasn't the accent. Control the scales of power. When Natasha freed the Black Widows, she says they can make their own choices now, and perhaps that relates to an increase in exposure to the horrors of Hollywood and an effort to move past it. If the story had more to say on this, so would I. Unfortunately, they mostly posture at these events being bad. There's barely any discussion on how this translates as an allegory. There's no attempt to learn anything about human nature, nobody manages to escape the mind control from sheer will or through connections made in love and family, etc. It's all rather blank, and if anything, it seems Natasha's history involving mental coercion and indoctrination acted as more of a hassle they had to account for than a piece of a grand story puzzle they were excited to put together. Other than that, the film opens on some Firefly commentary and closes out with them in the tree. I honestly think these visuals only exist as a placeholder for a video essayist to come along and desperately attempt to stitch elements of the movie together with. Like, I would be lying if I had any clue of what exactly this story had to say on these subjects, but it's not just about what is presented, it's also how it's presented. There is so much that doesn't flow properly. Jump cuts to avoid answering questions, cuts in action to convince you to forget about the enemies we know exist, cuts to provide characters armor, and a crap ton of brain-dead shots for viewers who aren't able to remember what's happening. It would seem you couldn't pay them to stop doing insert shots. They are clearly concerned you will not remember important items in the story. Remember the photo album? Look how she picks it up and puts it down. This will matter. Look, he's putting his helmet by his side. Oh, look, he's picking it back up. Make sure you at least spend 10 seconds showing us exactly where the package is or we won't understand what Taskmaster is trying to collect. 
The weirdest one is an insert shot that comes right after Yelena is injected with a syringe during her fight with the doctors. The director made sure we understood how uncomfortable she was to then show us the syringe being set down, only it didn't have any consequence, no lack of lucidity from the character, nor acknowledgement verbally. One might say they gave us this insert shot to confirm the plunger hadn't moved, and thus she would be unaffected. Only at that point you wonder why the syringe got in, but the plunger wasn't pushed. Had he simply attacked with a scalpel and missed, you erase all of these confusing elements. And there's a lot of that, editing choices that are baffling. How about the fact that their whole sham of a life, their fake suburban family, is about to be torn to shreds and they rush to escape with the editing being cut in an incredibly slow, at times jarring, paced out way to imply this is kind of just sort of happening, I guess. It's surprising just how much of this film has this approach. It's as though there are two competing editors, because you get slow, yet choppy as fuck progression where you can't rest on a shot for more than two seconds throughout even the most understandably methodical grounded scenes. It's a very limited understanding of how to portray events with filming techniques to accentuate instead of standing in the way. This film was clearly cobbled together in a dingy basement by a schizophrenic alien, which shouldn't come as a surprise when this story has managed to further Marvel Studios' inability to meld comedy and drama. Instead, they seem to relish them grating against each other. Let's take a look at three examples, and then the most significant breach caused by this malformed type of storytelling. In the prison scene, we see our heroes attack many people who are simply trying to prevent an extremely dangerous convict from escaping, as per their duty in the criminal justice system. As a result of being fired upon, they are buried in snow, and our heroes can't resist cracking out a bit of light-hearted commentary in the form of a joke that echoes in the script. This would be a cool way to die. This is a much less cool way to die. With the added bonus of being a pun. This on top of the senseless death taking place on either side of... Yeah, cheering at a time like this. Remind you of anyone? Getting real fucking tired of this shit. Moving on, we have the incredible joke where Yelena says Natasha's poses are clearly silly and designed to account for people watching her. Perhaps that would be the kind of commentary to work in in the right moments of a script. Unfortunately, it's sandwiched between Natasha explaining why she abandoned her sister, how they aren't truly family, and how she joined the Avengers to make up for the pain and suffering she caused. It lands like any embarrassing clunky joke having been injected specifically to match a mandate does only to be paid off later, written as though its purpose was to prove there are indeed setups in the script. That leads us to a scene in which we finally have some form of a quiet moment. Yelena uses the whistle that she and Natasha shared as children at her grave, paying her respects. only for this to happen. Wow. Sorry. This isn't a new problem for Marvel, we've had to deal with this form of incompetence in writing for some time, but man, when stacked against every other failure in this story, it's starting to become rather frustrating. Speaking of which, we recently went over something quite important, and now I'd like to flesh it out. Natasha Romanov's story is that of cleansing her life of bloodshed, to save people where she had been killing them, to live a life in stark contrast from where she came after having seen her sins laid out. Out. This storyline is kick-started in Avengers after Iron Man 2 introduced her. Dracoff's daughter, Sao Paulo, the hospital fire. Your ledger is dripping. It's gushing red, and you think saving a man no more virtuous than yourself will change anything? The idea being that this is at her core. Her executions of countless victims in her past is something she is constantly making up for. It's what we would likely have to see addressed in a prequel story for the character. And so, what did the next writer do? Your ledgers must be dripping, just gushing red. 
I couldn't be more proud of you. They made it a joke, which makes it harder and harder to be invested in her struggle. It's honestly a huge fucking shame, and events like it are littered throughout the script. Primarily because it's more than likely a mandate, but I would assume it's closely tied to an insecurity on the part of the writer. It's become clear that to make a Marvel movie, you have to make people laugh, cry, stand in awe, and come away thinking, Wow, I can't believe that character was in the after credits scene. And so it gets more and more shoehorned as time goes on. Speaking of insecurities, you guys remember how we need to stop the whole men making movies about women thing? Because of course men can't write women, it's ugh, it's always so cringe. And you know what? They don't understand that their sexual gratification comes through on the lens. For example, this is Joss Whedon presenting Natasha. Purely sexual, horrifying. Please go to assorted jails. This is the Russos presenting Natasha. Good god, jail. All of the jail, again, yes. Then we have Favreau. Oh, now you've done it, that's 17 jail. But oh wait, we now have a female director. One with experience and a lack of desire to present women as objects. Uh, in that case, why the fuck were there so many extended ass shots in this movie? Like, this isn't something I take issue with whatsoever, especially when characters are written incredibly well, but what the fuck? You were the chosen ones. You were supposed to cover up the asses, not show them. Bring balance to the sexism, not leave it in darkness. Uh, it's pretty well lit. I know there's always plenty of discussion to be had about female empowerment with movies such as this, but I found even less commentary of that regard in here than in Captain Marvel. Yes, the boss man says he hates girls, and he's too pathetic to hit her hard enough so she does it herself. <laughs> I am likely going to remember this movie forever by that one moment alone. There's commentary about women's clothing lacking pockets, a bit of can-do attitude, and as I said, the woman-hating supervillain. But nothing noticeable compared to the rampant inconsistencies, holes, and disrespect paid to the work in prior phases. Which kinda sums up what Phase 4 has been achieving. To do a quick refresher, we have story stretches, things that aren't quite believable but I suppose they could get away with, like Hydra not mad managing to stop or even keep up with the undercover family, Natasha's mother being killed for looking too close to the red room somehow, one hand slap on the iPad was the red alert option, there was only a simple latch on this thing, everyone wants to arm wrestle a super soldier, who also happened to immediately find his suit at Molina's because I guess she kept it for like 30 years or whatever, unfortunate random car hit the Black Widow, the fact that they have a knife fight despite the many guns that Yelena possesses, no one in clear view of this fight nor the driver care to do anything about it, the fact that they could have and didn't take her down remotely despite the dangers, and Yelena manages to evade the remaining widows. Twice. Dumbass master missing the box just in time, being unable to do anything about the cell, seemingly letting Natasha take off the mask, Ross managing to miss everything that happens in this film despite the incredibly public displays. But then we have the strains in likelihoods. For example, Natasha's sister was the one black widow to be free allowing everything to happen. Or that this happened at the only moment in around 10 years where Nat couldn't enlist the Avengers for assistance. How about the Budapest safe house? For some reason being, after everything, a bloody safe house. And they met up there through complete luck and they almost killed each other. Or how about Taskmaster not using guns but using explosive projectiles? What about the plan to attack Natasha on a bridge instead of simply waiting for her to park and collecting the vials with ease. I'm still not clear on how the vials were found. It should simply be impossible, or just incredibly lucky that Tugmaster caught up with them once they were out of this guy's hands. Cause fuck me, if things had gone another way, he would have had quite a surprise in that bed. And then there's Natasha assuming this thing works for the government. I'm pretty sure Ross has no jurisdiction here. Why the fuck do you think this has anything to do with Ross? This person is dressed like fucking Urban Skeletor. <laughs> Yelena managed to hang on to this photo since she was like seven. Drakov's failsafe is dependent on widows having free, functioning limbs and weaponry. Budapest authorities don't exist in this story. They fall into the same safe area Nat used a decade ago after narrowly avoiding a shield throw that would likely have cut them in half. The guards don't check for contraband, while the sisters just hope Alexi is given the toy while somehow hacking this prison system. Why are these prisoners allowed to talk to each other? They ran out of fuel in their 
destroyed helicopter, yet we're within walking distance of their destination. In fucking Russia, the mind control tech was only engaged after Natasha escaped, in the hopes that no one else would, when he could have just used it the whole fucking time. There was no strip search or mind control for the heroes when captured, fucking everything in the final act, which brings us to the holes, like traveling from Ohio to Cuba on one tank with a full plane after taking significant damage while being chased by people with these. Taskmaster was able to find Black Widow when she was hiding from fucking everyone, and also lost her for no reason once they had the fight scene. Doing all of this bullshit in the prison alerted nobody and tempted nobody to shoot Alexei. The Soviets only ever decided they wanted one super soldier and ended up deciding to get rid of him. They didn't kill him though, they just put him in prison? Pretty lucky for him and our protagonists, I guess. Not to mention Yelena killing Drakov when the pheromones should have stopped her. I mean, they shouldn't, but the way they established how well they work in this story, they absolutely should. How about the fact Natasha travels the world in public without a single concern for being recognized, despite the manhunt currently engaged for an ex-Avenger? And then there's the plot armor, the sheer insanity of the plot armor. Let's only re-reference the times where the amount of damage sustained would have killed or led to death. Dead. 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 Seriously wounded. Super seriously wounded. Dead. Dead dead. Pretty substantial, even when we're not including all of the other examples, and the impact of this damage isn't just reduced significantly on the part of rescuing characters from death. It's also portrayed in the most childish way imaginable, to the point that slicing out a woman's entrails looks like a strange, sweaty day at the gym. Kinda reminds me of that other movie where slicing a woman's throat is like giving her a slap. That's not to mention, by the way, how immaculate Scarlett Johansson looks and acts after the sheer level of carnage her whole body goes through. Then we reach the clown problems. The pheromonal lock. Just stuff fucking tuna into your nose or a pepper or fucking stand further away when you try and shoot him for fuck's sake. Please don't immediately go for the desk pop. A desk pop? Yeah! No, that's not real! Then there's the parachute, the fucking god of war fights. Uh, had Task Nasty just parachuted for herself, she could have watched Natasha splat herself into a puddle, endgame style. But her desperation to end Natasha's life for reasons was the only thing to save it. <sighs> the long and short is, this film is fucking riddled. It's a fantastic look into how you absolutely should not write a story. Every single meaningful moment is built up on contradictory and unreliable nonsense. To be invested, you have to find out ahead of time what the movie wants you to ignore in terms of cause and effect, because it's way too hard to figure it out as you're going, and there's not a single connective piece of plot in the entire film that doesn't suffer miserably. We absolutely have Aquaman syndrome in this film. Do that to anybody ever again. Ah! 
How the fuck did all of this insane, batshit nonsense never come up in the other movies? Natasha stopped a plot to take over the world in her spare time in the middle of a different movie. What the fuck? Which means it's time, folks. We did world. Theme. Plot. We have the one remaining factor. The factor that can honestly still maybe pull this story together character. Let's start with Drakov, the elusive figure in Black Widow's past that defined much of his suffering. His goal is to take over the world and to reduce the number of women because he doesn't like them. He doesn't commit to these plans in the easiest and most obvious routes available, and he constantly undermines himself by allowing his opponents to do whatever the fuck they want. His base of operations is as hilarious as his strategies, and his inventions are literally world-changing, but they all end up self-contained in this story. His control over Taskmaster is embarrassing, Black Widow could have been executed several times, and he doesn't seem to use the mind control on men, despite Alexei and many other strong lads being perfectly able to enter the Black Widow program. It makes you ask, why even use women? Men offer the statistical advantage of being built with broader, taller, and stronger bodies. They don't struggle anywhere near as much with basic strength challenges. Yeah, and Drakov hates the existence of women, so why make the majority of your fighting force women? We do have to exclude, of course, these lads who find their way around him a bunch. The Chad bodyguards willing to chase down intruders by falling through a literal hailstorm of enormous immolated chunks of debris just to end the lives of these traitorous scum. I mean, they look the part, but they have no faces or titles. The widows are freed, of course, cared for and understood as abused, coerced, and experimented on. But these lads? Well, they just work for Drakov, I guess. Nobody gives a fuck about discovering anything about them or freeing them from potential mind control. Oh well, another miss on the theme there, but who's keeping count? To roll us back, Drakov seems very invested in killing as many women as possible. Again, why plant women next to powerful men instead of just mind controlling the man. He wants to infiltrate the Avengers, yet he made no effort to throughout history until catching Natasha by chance when she was ousted, information he somehow missed. We don't really know why it was more beneficial to him and the main political stage to appear dead. We don't know why he never used his devices on powerful leaders. And outside of power, we don't really know what motivates him. And you know what? He was pissed off that his daughter was almost killed in the explosion, meaning he didn't see that bomb coming, so how the fuck did he and his daughter survive it? Yeah, you're right. Asking for explanations at this point is like drawing dignity out of phase four. Pathetic. Drakov practically topped himself via blood pressure when being called pathetic, despite everything we've seen about his history pointing to the opposite conclusion. Why the fuck couldn't he see right through her goofy-ass interrogation tactic when he was the one who raised her? He taught her every fucking espionage lesson she knows. Why couldn't we have a scene with respective dialogue that relies on what he knows about her training? <sighs> it's all such a fucking waste. It was clear when crafting Drakov that the writer wanted to take a part of Natasha's history and flesh it out, to have it become something even more haunting that filled a portion of her life we knew little about. In actuality, all they've done is piss on that portion of her history by giving us a moron villain who is no more threatening than a gelded walnut. So, how about Taskmaster? Well, she was in the movie for about five minutes, with one significant fight to speak of in terms of using the gimmick. For a character all about learning the opponent's movie, moves and reflecting them back, you really fucking wasted this idea. Especially as a villain for Natasha, a person who is all about close quarters combat. Seeing her learn to counter this creature by being one step ahead and using a fighting style with no predictable pattern could have been incredible. Unfortunately, what we saw was our unstoppable force being distracted, confused, or stuck in fucking slow-mo. We barely got any character work whatsoever, and she was only beaten because of awful 
decisions made in battle. This is especially baffling when it's made clear she has insane levels of strength, beating Alexei with ease, casually lifting steel plates, and getting through all kinds of day-to-day -day mercenary tasks with no problem. There is no reference to super strength or having any form of super suit, it's just accepted that old Tasky is a super strength individual, making the defeat all the more hilarious. Could have been a great villainous obstacle, but ended in being this completely wasted, embarrassing foot soldier not even Dr. Evil would have hired. Oh, I'm gonna have a lump there, you idiot. Who throws a shoe? Honestly. You fight like a woman. There's Mason, what we would call an arms dealer, espionage handler, vending machine, popping up in the woods like a mystical fairy dropping supplies on Natasha whenever she needs them despite the insane levels of heat she faces. She manages to sneak up on him sleeping twice. He doesn't seem to know what a safe house actually is. And he ferries mail between his undercover agents if they simply ask for the pleasure. In short, he's an idiot. He was created to facilitate a quest and we barely know who he is. And even then, his incompetence is incongruent with his history. Which means we have two significant characters left, and then our two protagonists. So let's start with Melina. A woman who went through the Black Widow program four times until she was promoted to head scientist for the Mind Control Division, and then she was planted as an American alongside Alexei to spy on Hydra when they posed as S.H.I.E.L.D. She ends up separating from her fake family members and continuing work. This this means, for decades, she didn't look in on them or look out for them, only to meet them once again to be told her work with mind control has affected many women across the world, including her faux daughter, to which she claims she had no idea was happening. She then gives them to Drakov, claiming she's just a mouse in a cage, only to be told she's not a mouse in a cage and that through pain she can derive strength, meaning she will now destroy Drakov, all of her research, and potentially her life to help these people because she still loves them. Maybe. I mean, when blowing up the entire facility, she does say this. Do you see the girls? We need to go back. She ends up with Alexei and Yelena in the end, and we don't see her reaction to Natasha's death. She will likely return in stories to come, as Rachel Weiss will likely want the paycheck, but I certainly hope nobody thinks of her as a strong character. <sighs> Everybody good? I am clearly injured. Melina is a horrid, cold son of a bitch. She's also a liar and an opportunist. The woman spent many, many years perfecting a form of biotech that is specifically designed to rid people of their ability to make meaningful choices. The idea that she can say, I didn't know who this was used on, or what it was used for, is not a fucking excuse. You knew exactly what you were creating. You simply turned a blind eye. She didn't delay this tech. She didn't install a failsafe. She didn't spearhead the antidote nor create one underhandedly. This is explicit in that the last vial goes to her for study at the end of the story. She claims to have switched sides thanks to the love she shares for the family, a family she never cared to help in any way, shape, or form. Yelena was the leader of the main division of Black Widows. Melina was the head scientist who started the mind control project with Drakov, a fact she announces with excitement. How is it possible that she couldn't have known about the mind control's application. She lied and she got away with it, something she does many times. Like the lie that she would turn on Drakov for the love she shares when in actuality this plan was engaged to free her from Drakov. She put absolutely no effort in coordinating with her family. She simply detonated the structure and escaped. She only brought Alexei for protection. She's ruthless. She left Taskmaster in a cell to die, telling nobody. An innocent woman under no less mind control than the daughter she lamented to explain she knew nothing about. She strangled a pig, with glee no less, to simply tell our characters with excitement about the mind control working. She takes pleasure in the suffering of others. She was absolutely complicit in the capture and conditioning of thousands of children, not to mention their deaths. She needs to go to prison. Never let them take your heart. Oh, fuck you. How many hearts were lost thanks to your absurd negligence? How many women died because of your cowardice? They want us to believe that she loved both her girls, that she always wanted out. I don't want to go. 
Yet you stayed for decades, and you only took the opportunity to leave when it arose in such a way that you could have escaped unscathed. You didn't check in on either of them once. And as I said previously, her plan seemed much more in line to kill her entire team than rescue them from Drakov. And as said previously, the human trafficking commentary is not only limited, it's kind of embarrassing because it's clear they had no clue what to say about it. It sits right next to real-world issues, but they simply required the event for the plot line and slapped it's not good on the process. This is accentuated by Melina in that she is responsible to a significant extent for many women having their reproductive organs torn out. And they chop them all away, everything okay, out, okay. so you can't okay, have babies. Okay, you don't have to get so clinical and nasty. Incredibly fucking strange to make a joke about that process when Natasha broke to pieces explaining what she felt as a result of it in Age of Ultron. They sterilize you. It's efficient. One less thing to worry about. The one thing that might matter more than a mission. Okay, you Fucking worthless storytellers. Melina is then welcomed back, because she was unclear on if she was allowed to do good before Natasha told her so. That's like a redemption, right? It happened so fast I wouldn't blame people for having no idea why she spent her entire life creating technology she enjoyed and believed in, only to switch to a complete saboteur and double agent after one conversation. Hopefully you don't remember anything about her history. Please don't mind the decades of torture she perpetuated. Fucker wasn't even mind controlled. And I don't even know why. <sighs> now, this isn't actually an accurate profile dictating this horrible woman's existence and actions because the movie and its writers believe she's a great person who came through in the end. She's celebrated and rewarded for her efforts. She talks about the things she values and what others see in her, but it's entirely incongruent with the majority of the decisions she ends up making. Which means she isn't a complex character with multiple layers that's going to be a villain as time goes on, she's just incredibly poorly written. Perhaps we will see something similar as we progress. Alexi is next up, the man who, outside of one incredible move in 95, has been characterized as selfish, boorish, idiotic, and almost entirely useless. The key part to his characterization that I cared the most about, however, was figuring out if he actually felt for the fake family. He describes it again and again as something lame and boring, taking him to tears, and when he discovers they are hurt by it, he struggles to say he was being a coward, and that there's nothing more important than the job he had of protecting and raising them. I find this hard to believe, not only for the many references we've been over, but for one at the beginning, where he's talking about his career to Drakov while his beloved wife of three years that he felt something real with was bleeding out in the background. Alexei's history is essentially that of a strong man hired by the Soviet Union, beefed up by a super soldier serum, and then let loose on missions. But I can't tell you anything about him, other than he's an asshole who fucking breaks people's hands for fun. He doesn't care about the girls that loved him as a father getting a hysterectomy and having their wills stripped from them for most of their lives with his approval. However, hearing what he had to say would have been worthwhile for any character we're supposed to understand. For a guy who is desperately trying to make up for these mistakes, it's awkward to watch the movie refuse him the chance. When they came and took you away from me, no cost is worth that. You should only sacrifice yourself. Think. I bared my soul to you, and it was just you the whole time? Yes, I'm afraid so. You can no, let go of me now. You smell really bad. The only thing you care about are your stupid glory days is the Crimson Dynamo, and no one wants to hear about it. It's the Red Guardian. Get out! Melina. This is the last time that we... Damn it. There's something I need you to know. I'm sorry. No more excuses, okay? I gave my life for a cause. You I don't. thought I was being brave. You, you don't have earpiece. Why not? Because it wasn't part of the plan. Oh, yeah? Well, what was the plan? You got some to say? Let's just mess it up. There's a delicious irony in that out of the four family members, he has committed the least atrocities and the movie looks down on him the most. It's also incredible that the story makes me feel bad for this shitty human being by the fact of the universe constantly preventing him from sharing his feelings about any of these circumstances. He describes himself as muscle. He said he just wants to fight. He said the undercover missions were boring and that he has no options when it comes to attempting to reconcile with his family. 
Sully. This, despite his apparent care that I do not believe is substantiated in the entire story. No, I don't think it weighs that much that he has a tattoo of Natasha and Yelena's names on his shoulder in Russian. Details like that only hinder my understanding of him when in conjunction with the other references. But the time I was truly thrown for a loop was his attempt to make Yelena feel better. He first respects her wishes to remain silent, which seems uncanny for Marvel at this point. You expect he will simply fart to enhance the comedy of the character. Only the scene ends, and for a moment I felt something. A spark in my cold, dead, long man heart. Then we cut back, and he's talking about how his dad pissed on him. Frostbite sets in quick. My father. He go toilet on my hands. Oh my god. Thanks, Marvel. You just had to have that in there, didn't you? You couldn't find any way for that to not be in the script. So what Jeff said, to be fair, he was suffering from frostbite. I am not asking for a justification for why his dad pissed on him. I'm talking about <laughs> raising that story in that moment. <laughs> It's okay, it made sense that he peed on it him. It makes sense that he pissed on him. <laughs> <laughs> but then something happens. I want my song. Alexei started to sing the song Yelena enjoyed as a child, a song that he remembered despite so much time having passed. And that works. That says something. That actually means he cared enough about her to remember something she cared about. Alexei singing American Pie to Yelena was a at David K. Harbour idea during rehearsals. One of my favorite moments from the movie. Oh. One of Alexei's only human moments had nothing to do with the writers. I guess I shouldn't be shocked. They are fungus people. I mean, think about this. We have a character that would have gone through the same indoctrination as many Black Widows. He's a man who believes in the party completely. He criticizes Western culture and he idealizes the fight more than anything. This man is fucking ignored in a storyline about a lack of free will through different forms of control and upbringing. Every value he has related to Drake and the old regime is already an interesting prospect, but this man fought against his own team by the climax of the movie, and no one even knows if that was a difficult choice. Alexei was no less used by the state and tossed away to rot than any other Black Widow, and his fate was that of being scooped up and used once again by the very family who couldn't give less of a fuck about his health and safety. But hey, they're mad at him because he doesn't remember them more fondly. That seems about right. It's totally not another example of the theme being annihilated. And so, what about his ability to fight? Because I value choices in action scenes, they tell us a lot about a person. Only Alexei is beaten again and again and again until he is rescued and then the film ends. He's not only inconsistent in his approach with dialogue versus his espoused values, he's ignored by the film, tossed away as an annoying idiot. It's frustrating to watch and hopefully a writer with more guts in the future can fix him up. Though, much like Drax with Thanos, it seems we've lost an opportunity already, in that Alexei held a huge grudge for Drakov, the man he felt betrayed him and falsely locked him up in prison for the rest of his life. It's unstated just how many years he lost in there, but it clearly weighs on him and there's one man to blame, the same man who rose him to glory once upon a time. Once the story is over, the two of them don't even get to share a word, let alone a scene of closure. It's unclear that Alexei even knows Drakov died. We don't even know that he cared. There are very few characters I would describe as a complete and utter waste, but David Harbour's Red Guardian is absolutely one of them. The guy that the Soviets created to combat Captain America, and then they just put him in a prison, and <laughs> yeah. he could probably escape, but he just doesn't. He's just enjoying his time there. It's kind of surreal. There is absolutely nothing concrete on the idea that the Red Guardian was created to combat Captain America, nor is there anything to imply he could leave the prison but enjoys it there. In fact, both of these ideas were countered by dialogue in the movie. He puts me in prison for the rest of my life. He just runs off and hides, huh? Hello? Captain America was still frozen in ice then. 
It's being made clear that fighting Cap was a lie. He wouldn't have been created to combat Cap because Cap was in the ice for as much as 40 years before Alexei was even born. And Alexei's time in prison is not something he looks kindly on. This isn't me throwing shade, by the way. It's evidence that without even realizing it, people are writing stories for Marvel in real time to provide any kind of substance to the origin and values of these characters. What a sorry fucking state we're in. Which means we have two characters remaining. First... Yelena, the new Black Widow and the last we're going to be seeing a lot more of in the time we have coming. So let's rewind on her a little bit. Yelena is possibly the biggest victim in the film going strictly by the events as described and seen. She was ditched by her three-year fake family and forced up to her opening scene to be mind-controlled into doing anything and everything Drakov wanted since she was incredibly young. The action she was forced to take involved killing many innocent people people, some of them close friends. That was on top of facilitating Drakov's domination of political powers worldwide. Nobody who claimed to love or care about her did anything. They didn't even know much about it because they didn't care, and by the end of the story she essentially forgives them through circumstance. She has my pity in that regard, but don't bank that pity until we finish this section. Yelena had the experience of mind control as badly as possible. It started from a very early age, and she's been running with it up to as late as 2016. Natasha didn't have it at all, but other widows seem to have had a similar treatment. What's important here is the description of the experience is that of having no idea what part of you is you, and to be free of it means you can finally make decisions. I don't know if you guys can imagine this, but if you go through almost your entire life without being able to make a single decision, only for it to all be dropped on you in a moment, you would think that if it doesn't crush you you mentally, leaving you as useful as a slab of wet bread, that it should have you questioning your entire existence. What, at this point, does it mean to be human, to be living, to have led a meaningful life? Imagine what it might do to you if that facet of your existence was taken for just a day. Imagine a story taking the time to represent that. Have you ever had someone take your brain and play? Pull you out. Stuff something else in. You know what it's like to be unmade. You know that I do. It's, uh, it's a great script, folks, whether you think it's shot flat or not. Meanwhile, the only thing we really get from Black Widow is this. David Osla. Yelena's first apparent reaction to this comment from Natasha is almost fury. How dare she comment on how much Yelena has grown when she's forgotten all about her. She doesn't even know that most of Yelena's childhood years weren't even experienced. And upon recognizing that fact, she turns to sadness. She lost most of her childhood. It was taken from her, and she only recently started making choices. Unfortunately, this is akin to getting blood out of a stone, as there are so few references, and I do think the acting is serviceable in this story, but Florence Pugh delivered this next line so piss poorly that it's about as convincing as a vegan lion. I've never had control over my own life before, and now I do. I want to do things. <sighs> so why is she so bungled as a character when considering her extensive history? Well, Yelena is a piece of poorly executed retroactive continuity, damaging her position in this long-running story as well as her character via the future goals of the writers. She couldn't appear out of nowhere. She has to simultaneously come from somewhere, grow up to this age, and have some reason to not have been involved in anything that's happened so far, which amounts to popping her into existence with extra steps. She needs to be an MCU action heroine, kitted out with all kinds of tech, fortitude, and gumption, ready to take on even the hardest of foes with no intention of relenting while cracking a joke here and there because she ain't all about the work. There's a good old-fashioned down-to-earth girl under the widow training and we love her. Except that profile cannot coexist with her history. She's killed as many as hundreds of people without her will intact. She has witnessed the blood bloodshed first hand, with no chance of putting a stop to it. That's haunting as a fate. She's never made a decision in her adult life, and none of the people she thought cared for her lifted a finger to help whatsoever. This woman needs decades of therapy and care. But it turns out she's absolutely fine. She's ready for the next MCU adventure. Oh, come on. I mean, they're in great poses, but it does look like you think everyone's looking at you. 
Tag team. Aw, he's sensitive. See why you keep him around. Adlich, Nick, can we throw him out the window now? I think we should wait till we get to a higher altitude. She's more well adjusted than most of the mental illness adult teens of modern Western society. It's incredible. You're fully conscious, but you don't know which part is you. I'm still not sure. Then act like it. This almost feels like lip service to character writing. How incredibly interesting she could have been had they actually used her history. And as if that wasn't bad enough, this woman demands that I hate her as a hero. Take for instance the fact that Yelena sent the vials to Natasha via mailing them to the safe house in the hopes that an agent would pick them up and pass them on to then go to the safe house herself. Why not just take them with you? Especially when separating yourself from them in any way is incredibly dangerous and potentially world-shattering in terms of Drakov's plan. This applies whether or not she was Mason's agent. But we've been over how much that makes no sense either. Then there's the fact that she enjoyed what she caused at the prison, something that will stain her character forever. And then there's her motivations. She wishes to expose the Red Room and save the women within it. Well then, why the fuck is she pointing a gun at Natasha as she enters the safe house instead of sitting down and explaining with haste, the incredibly sensitive situation. Not only does she believe that Natasha is an active Avenger, she believes she is the last person on Earth with the resources and knowledge to make a significant difference in destroying the Red Room as it stands. She almost killed Nat several times when she's the only real hope of getting any progress. The goal should be to inform Natasha, but we just had to have the heroes battle each other. We always do that when they meet for the first time, right? Unfortunately, this is not isolated. Yelena was told by the woman who set her free to free the others kept in the same hell as her. As much as I feel a strong amount of pity for her in that regard, which we will talk about more in just a sec, she's doing nothing to prevent that hell from rolling forward with every other widow. You will notice that her plans don't immediately encompass how to best free these women. Instead, she decides to send those vials off in the hopes her fake sister from years ago that forgot about about her can pass it over to her superhero friends, the ones who are currently chasing her. Not only was this an incredibly stupid and inconsiderate thing for her to do, it goes against her entire history and her values. She has opportunities to save these women throughout the story, and every time, other than once where she was simply too late, she chooses alternatives. At the end, however, she makes a choice to break every single vial in the room filled with widows. On the surface, you might think that's a strong choice, matching her knowledge and values, but it's only through sheer luck that they have an additional vial. Or rather, two. She intended to break them all, condemning every last individual in the Black Widow program, that Yelena was fully aware of, to a life absent of autonomy. Yelena is a horrible moron, and she doesn't behave as though she has the history we're told she has, or the values we're told she has. Not to mention that she's supposed to be the top-tier leader of the Black Widow, an incredible assassin, almost unstoppable. Yet we constantly see her making decisions that are entirely idiotic. That's alongside being one to overpower and lead in many circumstances, yet the one time she has to perform an act of strength while lacking a body double replacement, it's pathetic. So why do people love Yelena? Well, it's because of scenes like this. Can you do like a fighting pose? It's if, yeah. <laughs> It's a fighting pose. You're a total poser. Not a poser. <laughs> the best part of my life was fake. And none of you told me. It was real to me, too. Pew performs very well at times, and she vaguely matches what we know of the character in her history. Sometimes. It's the kind of thing we watch movies for, to feel what these people are going through. It is, however, not committed to. Yelena is mostly out of character in the entire film. She goes from being a deadpan, joke-delivering, world-observing, jester-action hero girl to broken, betrayed, and abused, explaining the horrors inflicted upon her and their repercussions. A life without choice and meaning. This experience is catastrophic and they only let Yelena feel it when they provide her an allowance in the plot. Otherwise, it's the standard action movie affair filled with the well-adjusted wisecracker when it should be carried with her at all times. They just get right in there and they chop them all away 
everything okay, out. Okay. This shouldn't have happened, not just because of the crude nature and frankly inappropriate as fuck timing, but because Yelena is a woman who had her chance of creating life stolen from her in a barbaric operation to help keep her on track as a mindless assassin, orchestrated in large part by her fucking fake mother. It was only days ago that she could properly reconcile this experience and history, that not only has she never made meaningful choices, but that she's now wrestling with the consequences of the damage everyone else has inflicted upon her with surgery, conditioning, and lies. Yelena should be infuriated at the mere mention of her faux mother. Melina is lucky to be breathing when in the same room as one of her greatest victims, puppeteering this helpless animal while it struggles to breathe, enjoying it as her prior experiment looks on. There is no reconciliation for these two, there's no redemption Yelena would accept. Blood should have been drawn the second they were in range of each other. It's fucking pathetic writing and it's throughout. Both parents. She had every last inch stripped away piece by piece to now see the face of the man who helped seal that fate and she's cracking a fucking joke. Piss off. Treat it with the gravity you invite when writing it. Makes everything easier. Even killing. You still think you're the only monster on the team? Oh, well, I was about to talk about fallopian tubes, but okay. Oh. We shouldn't celebrate this. Moreover, it should be condemned instead of excused because you enjoyed portions of a performance. I mean, people enjoy both characters Florence Pugh portrays, and sometimes she gives quite a bit of effort to properly represent them. This has given her the accolade of being the standout role in the film, and she's cited as the one good part from many people who thought this was a disaster. I think she's as broken as the rest, but with this one moment acting as possibly the best thing in the whole story as it doesn't shy away from the subject matter they chose to use as a backdrop, I understand why people praise the character, but you should demand a hell of a lot better. The woman we see here should have been in the whole story. Which leaves us with the very last writing element. This one, if it works, could theoretically pull the whole thing together. We have broken world building, a shitty villain, a plotline in tatters, a supporting cast of monsters. But perhaps our protagonist hero can save the day. Perhaps Natasha Romanov can bring us home. So, here we go. Natasha's story starts with being sold by her family to Drakov. After that, she spent some time in the Red Room, only to be reassigned on an undercover mission posing as Alexei and Melina's child, along with Yelena posing as her sister. She spent three years in Ohio conducting this lie until she left and was placed back into the Black Widow program. During one of her missions in later life, Clint Barton was sent to kill her. He made a different call. They worked together to bring down Drakov, using his daughter to ensure the mission was successful sacrificing her as collateral. Natasha then went back to S.H.I.E.L.D., worked for them as an agent in many circumstances to then join the Avengers, and after many years of serving, she died, ensuring they could save the universe. Natasha's throughline is family as sentimental as that sounds. She's a character ruled by the idea of connection with a group of people, people you can rely on for support, safety, security, warmth, and happiness. The additions they've made to her story in this film have pros and cons. Let's first go over the pros. Natasha being a part of an undercover family when she was young, after having been torn from her birth parents only to bounce in and out of the Black Widow program, is almost an excellent backstory. It supports what we know of her history, and it adds to her core motivations. It's a time she wants back. Furthermore, making the mission to defect to S.H.I.E.L.D. to allow her the opportunity to begin making a new life dependent on executing a little girl can operate in a significantly symbolic way, while sufficiently drenching her ledger. It's something to be mined for meaning, that she may have had to kill an innocent part of herself to finally escape Drakov. Only the logistics and execution of these ideas leave the script with much to be desired. So, that about does it for the positives. Let's look at everything else. Natasha isn't acting very much in character, and we're going to split this up into three sections. The first will relate to her strategies in battle, the second is her general intelligence, and the third section would be her core values. 
So, first up we have her decisions to taunt Ross when she has nothing to gain from the interaction. Her decision to talk to Ross about the Drakov incident when she knows she would be captured indefinitely. Taking no precautions when her safe house endures a power cut. Deciding to push this pole into a building. Not providing the battle plans with Alexei both before and during his escape while chastising him for being incompetent. Every single thing she does in this insane chase sequence. Keeping the vials in public view at a public restaurant diner place while being chased by Black Widows and the US government. Having zero concerns about waltzing into Melina's compound after being fully aware of her allegiance, the mind control, and standard defensive systems to then believe and support Melina's plans. And she believed Drakov was dead because no body was found, which in her line of work should have made her suspicious of the opposite. The gas immunizes the brain's neural pathways from external manipulation. Maybe in English next time? Natasha can understand that. Fucking I can understand that. You did that for a joke. These events in separation are pretty forgivable. Well, some of them. But together they are damning. Natasha is supposed to be quite the strategist, with decades of training from both the Black Widow program and S.H.I.E.L.D. Though it's worth remembering, S.H.I.E.L.D. had Natasha and Clint kill Drakov and destroy the Red Room with no proof required for either mission. Leading to both the man and the operation being fully active, if not in a better state than before. All Nat and Clint had to say was, well, we're pretty sure we got him, and don't worry about the Red Room, that's probably gone too. So maybe S.H.I.E.L.D. training makes you a moron, which makes some sense because we have to watch as Natasha bumbles around making obvious mistakes in almost every single scenario in this film, but specifically in the middle of battles and when trying to formulate solutions related to stressful circumstances. She is not rewarded for her abilities, rather she stumbles through every scene with the universe back her throughout. And if we stopped there, we could say she's lost that element of her character, but she is still Natasha Romanoff. Leading to the next point. Natasha is unbelievably stupid in this story. She believes her sister is in the safe house because her safe house handler said she was given mail sent with her name to the safe house attached with a photo of her and her sister. She manages, beyond all reason, to get to this safe house and she happens to be absolutely right. This safe house is the same one one she's apparently been in and out of with Drakov's support that S.H.I.E.L.D. breached her on and that Hawkeye tried to kill her in. She figured she was safe at Melina's compound. She thought the insane plan from the third act was... <sighs> she also did this. In conjunction with the prior set, she is now categorically inept, which is a far cry from her skill set. Natasha Romanov is incredibly formidable because of her creative yet grounded thinking, perfect for solving problems that would likely have killed her otherwise. She's not an idiot who hopes everything will work out. To fully illustrate what's been lost, let's compare an aspect of her abilities that should be top-notch, as it's specific to her training and she's practiced it for decades, making her a master. Natasha conducts two interrogations in The Avengers, one in her opening scene and one with Loki. She also conducts one in her own movie, taking place in the third act with Drakov. Let's compare that opening scene with the Drakov scene. <laughs> The first thing we see happen is Natasha getting hit, to then express to the audience frustration and boredom. Only to her captors, she poses as very much afraid and completely out of her depth. Her captor then makes an assumption on who she's working for. Whoever Salahub is, Nat needs information on him as well as the lads here. By posing as an agent with poor information, misplaced confidence, and a subtextual admittance that the interrogator is correcting her, she's coaxing information she may otherwise come across as desperate for. Salahub. Courier. On prikritye. Skazhi Lermantavu. As a form of boast, the captor is telling Natasha that Lementov is not the man who moves their materials and that she has outdated information, prompting the correction. He's asking that Natasha pass this on to her boss. Of course, she's lied about having a boss that isn't S.H.I.E.L.D. while simultaneously trying to come across as having given that up by accident. Only Coulson interrupts her and her glamour drops, talking to Phil in a completely different tone, surprising her interrogators. I'm in the middle of an interrogation this moron is giving me everything. I don't give everything. 
And this is the climax. We have a complete demeanor change from Nat as she speaks to S.H.I.E.L.D., chastising them for interrupting her work and insulting her captors for having given her what she needs. Look, you can't pull me out of this right now. Natasha, Barton's been compromised. Let me put you on hold. This is Natasha Romanov. Creative, resistant, fantastic under <laughs> pressure, superbly intelligent, manipulative, and of course, seductive. This scene completes with her dominating her captors, grabbing her shoes, and revealing she was conducting the interrogation the entire time, only to be told she has to see Bruce, giving her pause for thought. A wonderful juxtaposition to how bold she just was, assisting the audience's understanding of the Hulk and his reputation. Now, let's take a look at her solo movie. The interrogation opens with this. Are you gonna fold me into your pathetic little puppeteer act? Pathetic, huh? Natasha begins with telling her subject they are pathetic in the hopes that they get defensive. An interesting choice when dealing with Drakov, the man who for 30 years plus has controlled the most secret espionage institution with a deft hand, having complete victory within his grasp. But let's see what happens. The real war was fought here in the shadows. You didn't fight in the shadows, you hid in the dark. Again, she focuses on belittling him, a single track that if fails, leaves her with nothing. Her power comes from undetectable influence. No one's noticed, then why even do it? You're nothing. She's saying that he's pathetic and has nothing because no one knows what he has, when that was the plan, to subvert the world leaders, or, well, everyone without their knowledge, to take over every significant industry and organization without anyone having realized it. All she's highlighted is his success, a success she shares in her line of work, being that she is desperate for people to never know what she has or what she's capable of. He has control of a major empire with the potential to control every single person in the world. I would say that's pretty incredible. More so when it's being conducted entirely in secret. Yet that very element is what she's trying to shame him with. The dialogue is entirely lost, employing a very basic form of reverse psychology, the kind of shit children do without having really thought about it. And to add insult to injury, Natasha is doing this to the guy who organized the entire system that taught Natasha how to do this in the first place, in a way that's the saddest part. Why wouldn't Drakov announce that this is the most embarrassing display he's ever seen? That in his many decades of teaching black widows how to siphon information from a subject without their knowledge, he's never seen such a sorry attempt, in a way he's ashamed she would try. She could then evolve the conversation into a meta back and forth about his guidance, his teachings, and the program itself. She can draw information out of him by claiming the widows are insufficient, that she's proof his operation will fail and that he couldn't possibly have any foothold worth using. When he either oversteps defensively or the interrogation fails, she could realize that being sincere about her own history is exactly how she can get to him. There were so many options here and instead of any of them we did this. Stop it! Don't tell me to stop! I'll tell you when to stop and how will you know when to shut up? Ah! And so she interrupted him and told him to shut up. This made him upset, and like any king of the incels, he spilled his entire design to her, on top of revealing the access requirements. He gave her everything in the hopes that she'll say something positive about him. Easier to be tough in front of defenseless little girls, huh? <laughs> You can see the writer's hand throughout this scene. She says he's pathetic, and as a defense he blurts out his entire plan and current status to impress her. You wouldn't be so glib if you had any notion of what I've built. I own this world. Me. The only thing we need to finish this off is her spelling it out. You seem desperate to impress me. I don't need to impress you. These world leaders, they answer to me and my widow. And that's pretty much it. She managed to coax everything out of his subject by essentially saying you're pathetic and you want to impress me by telling me what you've done and showing me how to access your console. It doesn't even line up with the film's own logic. She's telling him the problem is that he's achieved it without people knowing. And his response was, oh yeah? Well, look at just how much everyone doesn't know. Like, if we're pretending she made a good point, which is how he feels, then he didn't counter it at all. In the prior example, she used her wit, her deception, her 
her sex appeal and her combat training to finish it off. In this instance, she got punched and says you're pathetic. So what, now you're gonna fold me into your pathetic little puppeteer act? Pathetic, huh? And it worked. She is rewarded for her brain-dead approach, telling her subject what she wants while using absolutely no tact, no physical expertise, and no manipulation beyond getting incredibly lucky. And that's on top of the luck of seeing how to access the console. Had he faced away from her while accessing it, she would have been fucked. In the first scenario, the subject doesn't even realize their own taunts have provided information. In the second, the subject is desperate to reveal everything because he was told he's sucks. Natasha Romanov, in terms of her abilities as Black Widow, has been completely reduced. From her general intelligence, to her battle plans, to her primary abilities of manipulation and interrogation of subjects, to even her combat have been crippled significantly, or entirely stripped away in the movie that's supposed to be all about her. It's a huge shame, because these elements help give her an enormous impact on screen, especially in the Loki interrogation. <sighs> All right, enough. Let's break that scene down. To really bring home how far the MCU has fallen when it comes to writing, let me explain why this fucking scene is a banger, and it's far from the only one in The Avengers, one of the strongest movies in the MCU. Loki has been captured by S.H.I.E.L.D., and they want to know why he gave up so easily, as well as where he's taken the Tesseract, leading us to this scene. There's not many people who can sneak up on me. But you figured I'd come. We open nice and subtle with a smile. The god of mischief, a king of illusion appreciating a human's ability to surprise him with her arrival, and an appreciation from Natasha that Loki is smart enough to know she was on the way. Not just because this is one of her roles in S.H.I.E.L.D., but because she has an investment in Barton and Loki has been privy to Clint's insight. It's clear he is excited to have this exchange. So, this is pretty good for a few seconds. Both parties understand that Natasha needs information from Loki. However, Loki holds all of the leverage in this conversation. He has nothing to lose while having everything to gain in causing this stalwart woman, who has taken down so many in this very environment, a lasting moment of anguish. Something hundreds of people have likely failed to do, as is her reputation, giving him an increased sense of purpose at this stage. Because Loki, despite ideas from future writers, does indeed adore causing pain and fear. Once you're king of the mountain, what happens to his mind? Is this love, Agent Romanoff? This is the opening gambit. Natasha lets Loki know she cares about Barton more than the end of the world, a declaration that likely has a lot of truth within it. So he counters with a barb about love triumphing overall, a concept they both find childish compared to specific and meaningful investments for a person and your history with them. She goes on to explain when he asks that Barton saved her and set her life on a lighter path, that before him she didn't care who she hurt. This is quite a blatant yet prompted explanation giving the audience much more of her history to chew on. But it's entirely warranted in that it supports her opening and Loki is left with one response, to confirm Barton's value to Natasha. And what will you do if I vow to spare him? Not let you out. Oh, no, but I like this. Your world in the balance and you bargain for one man. Loki is now very excited, knowing that Natasha cares more for this man than herself, S.H.I.E.L.D., or the world, a man that Loki has complete control over. This is engaging for him because it means he can dig deep into her. If he says the right thing, she'll be distraught and terrified, but like any power dynamic flip, they hit harder with the soon-to-be victim sitting in some level of comfort. I got red in my ledger. I'd like to wipe it out. Can you wipe out that much red? This is her completed bargain. She's at the peak of her confidence and she's made it clear that in exchange for something, Barton must be spared. She's also provided a motivation to convince him she is telling the truth alongside a brief history topped with a desire to wipe said history of misdeeds, ones she's only alluded to. Natasha could be given the information she wants here to then reveal her lie being that she won't help Loki at all and that she merely tricked him along the way. Only Loki is a lot smarter than that and he's ready to spring his trap. Drakov's daughter, Sao Paulo, the hospital fire, 
Your ledger is dripping. It's gushing red. And you think saving a man no more virtuous than yourself will change anything? Now the balance has shifted significantly. Loki has revealed he knows far more of her history than she could have accounted for. That he was just humoring her in the prior half of the conversation. This is the basest sentimentality. This is a child of prayer. Pathetic! He knows her worst sins. He knows Barton's worst sins. He belittles the very concept of saving him as a microscopic moment of virtue in the face of her history. And he describes the effort as pathetic. Loki then strips down S.H.I.E.L.D. and humanity as a whole while we pan through the Avengers realizing that S.H.I.E.L.D. has lied to them. He does, however, make it clear that it isn't simply her history or her organization. It's her existence alone that's enough for condemnation. <laughs> I won't touch Barton, not until I make him kill you. Slowly, intimately, in every way he knows you fear. He charges forward, smashing her sharp buildup of confidence, and with his knowledge of her history, as well as Barton's, makes a very convincing threat of having Barton torture her himself in ways he knows will be effective. Natasha is horrified, and Loki completes his counter-proposal. And then he'll wake just long enough to see his good work, and when he screams, I'll split his skull! The choice of words to split Barton's skull after his good work is complete ends a very complex and terrifying description of what he can do to her through his own puppet, the man she cares so much about. Loki has finished his interrogation. He's struck Natasha exactly where she lives, scarring her for an indefinite time, giving him the satisfaction he wanted from the outset. We have flipped the dynamic of power and the payoff is now complete. But the scene isn't over. You're a monster. Oh no. You brought the monster. And there it is. In Loki's complete and utter confidence of his own abilities, his own execution of juggling every last piece of information he had, as well as bathing in the reaction he wanted on top of having relished in his primary victory, that of being placed on this very ship with his scepter and his goal to lay out Earth's mightiest heroes, he slipped. He further detailed the nature of his victory, the agitation and release of the monster, which, as a plan, is entirely close to completion. What he says is a simple jab. He's not the monster, he's the truth-sayer. The big green psychopath spawned from the human race is the monster, and the fact that this is what he has to say in relation to Banner tells us how he views him, making certain payoffs to come that much more satisfying. Regardless, he gave away just just a bit too much when celebrating. So, Banner, that's your play. What? Loki hasn't yet understood what just happened. It was too quick. He's still under the impression that he won, but Natasha's new attitude doesn't match that whatsoever. Thank you for your cooperation. And now that it's dawned on him, Loki won't even look at her as she leaves. He's now realizing what he just gave up, and that his plan could be compromised as a result. That small dopamine hit of torturing Natasha wasn't even close to worth it. Which completes the leverage being switched once again, in one scene. It shows us exactly who these people are. Two powerhouse intelligent characters at their best. Acting in ways that bolster their values, progressing the plot significantly, and providing interest introspection for them both in the future, being capped off with what could have been an awesome catchphrase Natasha could land on anyone she defeats in this environment. Instead, it's pilfered in an attempt to evoke a better time. Thank you for your cooperation. Imagine stealing that line for your shitty attempt at an interrogation scene while confidently forcing Natasha to slap her face into a desk for fuck's sake. Just a complete misfire. This, however, is one of Loki and Natasha's greatest scenes. It's from a story that wanted to boost them both as characters while clashing them in such a way that damage hits both sides. But most importantly, it was written by a storyteller, not a fucking chicken nugget. There is always in the middle of my day when my mom isn't there to cook the uh, chicken for me. And it only gets stronger as the movie progresses. One could ask, how did Loki manage to fall for Natasha's ruse? How is it that she convinced him it tore her up? How did he fall for it? Now you sound like you. But you don't. What did Loki do? He didn't just... I've been compromised.
It was real. Loki did do the damage he thought he dealt, hence his confusion. Natasha was convincing because she felt it. She's incredibly invested in Clint, not just as a friend. He represents what gave her a chance to become a better, stronger person, a hero. Her identity is tied to him. She is, however, experienced enough to compartmentalize this. She got what she wanted, and she did what she could with the information. Only later does she reconcile with what she felt. The scene is incredible because both characters were simultaneously victorious and damaged. The power levels shift throughout. These two highly skilled individuals were represented perfectly. The Avengers is one of the greatest installments of the MCU, and it's a shame that one scene from that film film is better than anything Marvel has produced in years. And that is why the Loki interrogation scene is my one marvelous scene. <laughs> now, we've made it clear that Natasha was torn down in terms of her abilities, and it's become embarrassing to watch her work. However, it's time we approach the most important part of her character. Her values. Natasha Romanov was a loving little girl, with conditioning having beaten that sensibility out of her. She committed heinous acts on behalf of other organizations, and only a chance encounter with another agent with a similar murky history knocked her into another path. After having killed so many, she attempts to join the Avengers to save as many people as she can, while reaching a level of comfort with them as her family. She will do anything to keep the individuals she loves together and happy. This is why she's so fascinating to understand in terms of who she will side with during Civil War, as her family tear each other apart. Creating a history for her is easy because it's already written. You only have to take care of connecting pieces and dialogue, which isn't easy, but it's more than many writers have to work with. And as long as Natasha's heart is in the right place, this movie might just make it. So let's quickly get the obvious out of the way. Natasha doesn't raise an eyebrow or complaint after seeing her sister launch an RPG at a guard doing the right thing. He's pushing back on this attempted facilitation of an escape. As a result, she kills him and buries the entire facility in snow. This is a huge torrent of blood to gush back into Natasha's ledger. It's exactly the kind of cold, reckless execution on a mass scale that should scar her emotionally considering the journey she's on. The fact that she didn't commit the act that led to it means nothing if she doesn't condemn her sister and struggle with knowing the release of Alexa is what cost potentially hundreds of lives. This is significantly out of character, but I suppose it's isolated compared to the next subject. We have learned, definitively, that Natasha knew about the other Black Widows. She knew about her sister Yelena, she knew about her mother Melina, and she knew about the Red Guardian and the Red Room. She would absolutely get them accounted for. Natasha Romanov, the woman who puts family first, would have made certain that each of these elements were taken care of. To account for this hole in the film, we are told she figured the Red Room was destroyed when Drakov died. A significant blow to her intelligence. We are told she figured Melina was dead. Wait, Mom Melina? We thought she was dead. Another significant blow to her intelligence and her values. We are told she not only thought Yelena got out, but that she didn't consider her a sister. You just didn't want your baby sister to tag along whilst you saved the world with the cool kids. You weren't really my sister. Whether what she said in the store was a lie, she spent the majority of her time in the MCU and her life not giving a single fuck about Yelena. And it doesn't benefit her in any way to lie about this. She wants to look out for her sister. Furthermore, Natasha was under the impression initially that her family gave her up on the street. She then discovers that her mother did sell her, but was killed trying to get her back. She doesn't look into this. She doesn't attempt to find the grave of her birth mother by looking into Drakov's records, nor does she show any any interest in finding her birth family. A family that may not have given up on her with the methods of Drakov's child abduction in mind. For all we know, Natasha's father is alive and well out there, looking for her. Though for some reason, they characterize Natasha as caring fully about her mother, but not her father. She has innumerable resources at her disposal at many points in the MCU timeline, and she uses nothing to further her core goals. Granted, she didn't have any leads before this story invented 
invented them. It's just baffling that she takes Drakov's word that there's nothing to be done and gives up on these people. When Natasha convinces Melina to defect, she does it by admitting that what kept her heart going all of these years was something Melina told her when she was young. Tell me, how did you keep your heart? Pain only makes us stronger, didn't you tell us that? What you taught me kept me alive. Melina was apparently a core inspiration for Natasha, and she believed she died by assuming that was the case, despite being aligned with the Avengers. I wouldn't even say that pain makes you stronger is the sentiment that best represents Natasha's core values, but it should be obvious at this point, if the avalanche didn't make it clear. Natasha Romanov has been thoroughly assassinated. We are told she abandoned every single significant person in her life related to family by assuming they were dead or fine. She condemned them all to a lifetime of misery because she forgot to look in on them. And when faced with this charge, she simply looks down, disappointed in her actions. This is about the furthest you can get from her character. It honestly seems like the movie is making fun of what we know to be her, what made us care about her. You feel anything when I killed your daughter? Is this your haunted past? <laughs> yeah, same energy as something else I'm familiar with. So you loathe your own being because of what's driving you. Now that's what I call an inner conflict. Natasha, often surprisingly, is much more sentimental than most Avengers. This is clear, if you remember, from her attitudes relating to Clint when we're first learning about who she is. We need you to come in. Are you kidding? I'm working. I'm in the middle of an interrogation. This moron is giving me everything. After her limited characterization in Iron Man 2, we see her being beaten and she shows little to no concern for it. It's part of the job. She will even brush off S.H.I.E.L.D. despite seemingly being in a dire circumstance to try and complete the now compromised mission. It's only when a certain piece of information slips that her demeanor toward Coulson changes. Barton's been compromised. Let me put you on hold. To be clear, she would rather endure torture to attempt to complete her compromised mission than assist S.H.I.E.L.D. in a mission they are interrupting with. Until they mention Clint, she puts him, and by extension the ones she loves, above everything else. I owe you. If it was the other way around, and it was down to me to save your life, would you trust me to do it? I would now. We can't track you in stealth mode. I need you. I'm not leaving this rock with one civilian on it. I didn't say we should leave. There's worse ways to go. Where else am I going to get a view like this? I can't sign it. I know. Well, then what are you doing here? I didn't want you to be alone. Come. Boy, it must be hard to shake the double agent thing, huh? Are you incapable of letting go of your ego for one goddamn second? Let me go. No. It's okay. This woman and the woman in Black Widow are not the same character. Regrettably, they have established action to the woman we knew in the MCU that is incongruent with her values. She is heartless, incompetent, narrow-minded, idiotic, sadistic, and she cares to the sum of nothing for both of her families in her prior life, while pouring more red into her ledger than was ever present before. I need you to appreciate this carnage after knowing Nat is characterized by the guilt from pain and suffering having splashed innocent blood on her hands. She signed the Accords, thinking on her very many public mistakes. She wanted to regain the trust of the average person, and yet we get this. It's so fucking weak. They can't even get the simplest of shit right. I chose to go west to become an Avenger. No, you didn't. You fled west in order to join S.H.I.E.L.D. and perform counter-espionage to make up for the the damage you did on Drakov's orders. You only joined the team in 2012. They made this mistake twice, by the way, in that Drakov never killed her for fear of the Avengers coming after him. They legit have forgotten the gap between her defection and 2012 in the history of this world. And so you end up asking why? Why the fuck did they assassinate Natasha Romanov? Well, with Phase 4 underway, this new era of superhero storytelling has blistered our screens. The MCU is 
desperate to introduce as many characters as they can. Characters are what draw audiences nowadays more so than stars. You can see this with Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man. Often cited as the three most popular superheroes whose names are enough to sell a project alone, whether with established or unknown actors facilitating the stories. It was only in recent years and with the help of Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. that Captain America and Iron Man have reached comparable heights. With their exits in Avengers Endgame and the remaining characters set to carry forward the series, Marvel needed to boost the audience investment to sell the other installments to come. They need more beloved characters. Talented writers can make you fall in love with one or many by creating a script that tells their stories in meaningful, consistent, and detailed ways. <laughs> It's embarrassing! You know what's fucking embarrassing is having you as my father! My mother was a scientist at Star Labs, and she was obsessed with turning me and my brothers and sisters into superheroes. What happened to your brothers and sisters? Some... died. Would you eat your friends? I know friends. If I die because I gambled on love, it will be a worthy death. Friends. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. I think you have a serious case of daddy issues. I have no issues with how much I love my father. He built the machines I employ today and taught me the secrets of calling the rats. But eventually, my father's burdens became too heavy to carry. He loved me. Don't you worry, eh? I'm gonna get you out of here alive. I'm going to get you out of here alive. They experimented on children! Keeping the peace is worth any price. Including the life of a hero like yours, sir. Don't make me do this. I knew Sebastian sensed good in you for a reason. Just keep that fucking rat away from me. We're girlfriends. I'm a superhero! If it wasn't clear from the clips, I thought the character work in THE Suicide Squad was pretty damn good. These people were built on their own foundations. Any connection you have for them is something they earned. You didn't tell me you had a fear for rats, Dubois. I'm an assassin! Why would I share my liabilities? <laughs> However, hack writers might just try something else to fast-track that very same process. Such as taking a beloved character, humiliating them over and over, only to present a new character for you to get behind. One that they fall in love with after a day. One that they celebrate and choose to die for. One that outclasses the very organization that humiliated our character in the first place. The one that gives them the chance to find their own strength and values. If you didn't like Sylvie and her storyline alone, perhaps she can borrow your appreciation for Loki by having him love her while explaining just that many times over. And what about another beloved character, one that made it through so much heartache after having to make a terrible choice, only to imprison and torture an entire town? She was saved and forgiven by Monica Rambeau, a woman that wouldn't give up. Even risking her life, she kept on trying to get through and eventually managed to reach our hero. Steve Rogers and Tony Stark were both shat on. It was said that the former abandoned Sharon Carter and the latter failed to support his team in life and death. Lucky for us, Falcon and Bucky managed to fix the mistakes of the long-gone heroes while accounting for a black man holding the shield as Cap didn't even bother trying to understand what that meant. Which leads us here. A story that was supposed to celebrate and elevate Natasha Romanov. Instead, she was sapped for all she was worth, assassinated thoroughly, in some cases for incompetence, in others for the same reason the rest of them were, to create room and a springboard for new characters, ones that have longer contracts, coming in to save the day, to correct the wrongs, to endure the mistakes and be better than the ones you love, convincing you to perhaps love them. Yelena is our new black Widow. She was abandoned by 
by Natasha to a life of pain and misery. But she escaped. She persevered. She also gave Natasha what she needed. She forgave her, and she killed Drakov. She even considered Natasha a sister the whole time. She kept tabs on her. She commented on her life as an Avenger, and she paid her respect to Natasha's grave. You will like Yelena going forward. She is where your appreciation for Natasha must be transferred, as Nat could do nothing but hang her head in shame once the retcon made itself clear. Fuck you. This whole phase isn't a passing of the torch, it's a torching of the past. An era where the writers can't tell the difference between heroes and villains. A fucking Lovecraftian circus of disappointment and disrespect. You guys remember that vest Nat was wearing in Infinity War? And how she has shorter blonde hair? They fucking soloed us on that shit. You're not a sportsman, Mr. I like your vest. God, I knew it. I knew you did. It's so cool, right? And you can put so much stuff in there. You wouldn't even know. I know how much you like it. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> it does have a lot of pockets. Very handy pockets, yeah. I'm gonna go break a few of them out of prison. <laughs> See if I can't help patch things up. Thank fuck they gave us the origin for things we actually cared about. The people who are currently in charge know exactly what they're doing when it comes to trying to milk the world of every dollar they can find. I'm sure the general public will eat each of these iterations up and the MCU will be strong for some time. But I genuinely hope it comes crashing down after just these few outings. I can only hope people can spot this shit as more and more of it trundles out, because they had no fucking clue what they were doing when it came to writing this story. This movie is jam-packed with the craziest levels of plot connections making no sense at all for any character involved. The best way to describe it is plot slurry. It consistently tries to find as many ways possible to avoid a through line. It spits on its own messaging, the world it came from, the people invested enough to care, and its titular superhero. There is no character, be it protagonist, secondary, tertiary, or villain that goes un scathed. They are botched, assassinated, humiliated, and ignored for the entire runtime. All in service of a fucking payoff that takes you to the next product. This story was delivered way too late, and it didn't regard the very part of Natasha's history that everyone wanted to know about. To explore the red in her ledger, and to meet the killing machine she was before Clint Barton spared her life. Instead, we got the woman who will leap into a coma by repainting a desk because she had an overwhelming desire to bash her brains in after reading the script. What a legacy. You go, girl. Black Widow was an enormous waste of potential, similarly represented in microcosm by a character that by all accounts is interesting as fuck, when taken from the source material, only to be turned into a mute, mind-controlled photocopy of a far more creative idea. Because that always works out. Does it even make sense that Task Lad has panther claws when Black Panther was revealed, like, days ago? Eh, whatever. The Whammon reveal was only manipulative, too. Olga Kirilenko can give you some interesting stares, but she doesn't have the body type to play the character you present throughout the movie. There are pieces you should avoid showing with the history you are presenting. They have to commit to close-ups when she's on screen because she clearly cannot fit the suit you gave to the man doing 95% of the work for the character. Many female characters get given bulky shoulder pads to level them out, but it's unlike anything we've seen them wear before and it ends up looking embarrassing, as though they needed to level out the stunt man taskmaster with the rest of the women by leveling out the shoulders. And that's not to mention the severely awkward compositing used to staple her head onto the stuntman's body in the deliberately few wide shots we get. It's almost as though they might very well have traded out taskmaster for task mistress well into filming. And all for a shocking reveal, only it's not shocking when you as an umbrella storytelling company generate this twist over and over again while forgetting to write a story behind them. It's getting ridiculous. You try and sell this shit as some shocking new idea, but women have been allowed in movies for a while now. You really gotta try something else. But hey, maybe there's a reason we didn't get Anthony Masters Taskmaster. Let's have a look-see. No, I mean, it was more a discussion of how do we make, cause Taskmaster was going to be involved and there was versions before I came that was Tony Masters. And it felt, I kept thinking, I was like, can this guy somehow not just be a goon? Like, I don't want like 
because Drakov and the Red Room is the thing that's tied into Natasha personally and her past. A giant nefarious, as we learn, spy station that is circling the globe in the atmosphere. So why is there this guy? Like, why, why, why would this guy be an arm of them? That's what I kept trying to be like. What is, I, trust me, I looked very far for like, how do we get this Tony Masters guy to believably be an agent of the Red Room? It just kind of leaned more towards other things were making sense. Other parts of the puzzle were adding up. Oh, they stole from Ohio the cellular blueprint of the Basal Ganglia? The way to deconstruct free will? Okay, they've got the ability to build, rebuild the mind. Oh, Drakov's daughter? She used Natasha? Used her as bait? Blew her up? Well, what if she didn't survive and this guy who has, you know, a lot of brain science is a good way to find these photographic reflexes. It just seemed to make sense. More sense. It just seemed to make more sense. End quote. Why would this guy be an arm of them? You're asking why a mercenary would work for the king of espionage as a bodyguard and trainer that can take down the Avengers. I, you're like a defective crayon how do you get to this point you apparently had no idea how to write anthony masters as anything but a goon while saying it simply makes sense to have a brain damaged explosion surviving drakov's daughter become task manager because you had drakov steal research on the basal ganglia how the fuck do you connect these dots taskmaster was given the mimic ability that's wonderful even if it's tech rather than skill that's something but you had them use it fucking once. These references to other heroes don't count. I'm talking about this one moment where a signature move is reflected back on Natasha. That's all we got. I've said prior that the Red Guardian battle was a completely embarrassing waste. Not just for the fact that they didn't allow Alexei to land a punch, but because they lost the chance to have him winning until his moves were accounted for and reflected, leading to a loss and the eventual rescue from a teammate. We did this with Thanos and Hulk, but we couldn't do it for the characters that are defined by it? You know what that is? Great. That's just fucking great! It was also incredibly cheap to put the Red Guardian and Taskmaster up and around all of the marketing only to feature them less than most secondary characters. And yet they were both portrayed entirely opposite to expectation, because that went so well last time. I wouldn't go in there for 20 minutes. <laughs> Black Widow, just like the rest of these writing abominations, is mostly well acted, mostly well produced, except all of the horrible compositing, the shoddy green screens, and the CGI looking like a big budget Channel Awesome production. Uh, it's mostly well choreographed, no, I can't say that. Like, we've been over so much of the bullshit fight sequences, but how about this? <laughs> What the fuck was that? How about these people looking around outside after an explosion has gone off with many shots fired? Your entire job is to watch the exits, you fucking blumpkins. There's tiny stuff too, like Scarlet taking off her mask from the bottom up, but switching at the last second when she remembered. Dude, how about this incredible gun trade? <laughs> How fucking awesome and totally not retarded. It has decent editing, like if you exclude all of the horrible editing, such as the splat. They cut to a wide, then they cut to a close-up, then a second close-up to really make sure you can avoid hurting the actress, to then cut back to her raising up. Like, this is sloppy as fuck, not to mention lazy. How about an example of someone pulling it off with less money in 2013? <laughs> Death. Seriously, Marvel, do better. Did any of you notice how it switched from day to night instantly? When Yelena leaves the table, it's day. When Alexei enters her room immediately after, it's suddenly nighttime. Whoops. Then you have the four women who enter the apartment and some of them fall over only for Nat and Yelena to enter this room just meters away. And we never see those women who are just behind them for the rest of the sequence. Like, j what are you doing? I don't know if you guys caught this one, but it's absolutely wonderful. Let me show you. 
<laughs> Nat is hit once and then again straight away by a different widow, but that widow hits her with a flying kick thing. Only thanks to the editing, she teleports to do it. Look at this shit, she's just standing there and suddenly she's flying right into Natasha. These two frames are side by side in the timeline. Fucking what? The kick even has two takes that are stapled together so carelessly that watching this scene in slow motion is only pain. Oh hey, how about when Task Bastard blocks a bunch of shots from Natasha with the shield, but literally a second prior we could see the shield was lodged in the car. So how do- ah, it's fine, editing can save anyone. Speaking of which, before Scully Girl blows up the car for a second time, there's no set of stairs leading to the subway. But once they flip backward and then fall forward from the APC, suddenly there's a staircase and it saves the fuck out of their lives. Excellent stuff. And since I don't see much of a viable place to pop this observation, let me take the opportunity to praise your subtitle department, popping white words on bright backgrounds. Just mwah. Beautiful. There was a decent soundtrack? I don't really remember any of it. Ah, look, this window dressing means nothing if the writing is that of Jackson Pollock's demented offspring. The fact is, we used to commit to stories that were run by character journeys, punctuated by choices. A man like Tony Stark comes to realize the damage he did to the world and the profit he made from that needed a rebalance. His ingenuity and creativity, fueled by the money previously generated, gave him the power to make significant change. There's no art opening. There is no benefit. There is the next mission. Well, then I quit. Now that I'm trying to protect the people that I put in harm's way, you're going to walk out? You're going to kill yourself, Tony. I shouldn't be alive. I'm not crazy, Pepper. I just finally know what I have to do. And I know in my heart that it's right. Steve Rogers wanted to help people. He wanted from the ground up to follow his country into a war that could just as easily kill him as give him the opportunity to fight. Once committing to becoming a lab rat and having been provided his power, he makes his choice to become far more than wartime entertainment. Do you want to kill Nazis? I don't want to kill anyone. I don't like bullies. I don't care where they're from. You told me you thought I was meant for more than this. Did you mean that? Every word. Thor, from a young age, was set to inherit the throne and rule Asgard. This destiny gave him no concern for what kind of ruler he would become outside of showing strength. It was only after spending time with normal people, moving through the world as a normal man, while witnessing what power hunger has done to his brother, that he chose to wield the power returned to him in a responsible way. We pretend on Asgard that we're more advanced, but we, we come here battling like Bilgeschneid. They trample everything in their path. In my youth, I called it a war. Every one of these stories is about what people choose to do with the agency they have. So what the fuck am I supposed to do with all this? There is no journey for these heroes. We get no significant growth, no defining choices related to power they already have or fail to understand. The entire third act barely concerns our protagonist Black Widows. Melina is the one who instructed them both on what to do and how to do it. It was her plan. Then, if you think about it, the first two acts were all Yelena's plans. She dragged Natasha into all of this. Natasha Romanov is a fucking ping pong ball getting bonked about by all the other characters in her own movie. And this character journey problem doesn't start or end with Black Widow. Captain Marvel's huge issue was that of failing to even recognize what her values were right before the end of her story, only to be provided more power than any hero in the MCU, annihilating her foes with glee. Forever wondering what it is she even thinks about any of this. If you don't understand what makes a character compelling, what gives their journeys meaning and why making a choice with the power you wield is important, your cinematic superhero universe is going to crash and burn. You saw what others had done and you took the next step but you didn't earn the story for yourselves and so you don't take any responsibility for them. You've shat on the shoulders of giants to accomplish something as fast as you could and before you even knew what you had, you patented it? 
packaged it and slapped it on every screen the internet could touch. Content. Content everywhere, but not a single story in sight. Because when it comes to milking, you were so preoccupied with whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. Forgive me for channeling Jurassic Park, but the film has a point. Marvel's new writers have the keys to the kingdom, and many beloved characters are simply being slaughtered. They've been given a complete sandbox, and the narrow-minded nature of telling a story the exact way they want has them hammering said sandbox until it even vaguely resembles the ideas they so desperately want on screen. The sad reality being that their own stories often fall in on themselves through their own payoffs being pre-packaged well before any ink hit any paper or any idea comes to light. <sighs> this movie should have been released alongside the other films in Phase 2. It should have starred Jeremy Renner, and it should have been about the relationship between those two incredibly strong friends, filling in their background while pushing them forward. But you didn't believe a woman could headline a superhero film financially. There was a time not so long ago that, it, that there was a belief that there couldn't be a, a, a leading female superhero. Yeah. Not by this guy, by the way. No, I know. Ever, but there, that was industry standard thinking. And so now you release this film, focusing some of the marketing on finally getting a woman on screen, finally giving the Avenger her own story, finally breaking that glass ceiling. Only it was already broken, several times in fact, and it left you with a condescending defecation of a script, accompanied by the lead suing the ever-loving fuck out of you just weeks later with several women to follow. Disney made their bed. It's about time they sleep. But you know what? Let's ask the real spicy question. Is this worse than Captain Marvel? Well, it took way longer to explain the laundry list of failures in this movie. It absolutely obliterated both its own characters and its legacy character. The world building is comparable to a goblin's mudslide. Thematically, it's as embarrassing as it is broken, and the plot has been reduced to atoms in terms of continuity. In short, yes, it's worse than Captain Marvel. And the MCU is going down a profane, sludge-ridden, dingy curse hole with no one making it out. Even dead characters struggle to stand clear of ruination. Perhaps that shouldn't be a surprise when the script was rushed out in 11 days. The sad reality is that people love this shit. They not only think it's not worse than what we've always had, some think it's better, if not the peak of MCU storytelling. So why should we expect any change? Some of these interviews that have happened for this movie and some of the things that they've been saying like baffle me i don't understand the process for them you know we can't do like normal taskmaster it, it didn't like what would we have just what like taskmaster but that do that doesn't make sense so yeah so so anyway we could have uh, uh drakov's daughter that just made a lot more sense it's like that's not you're not saying anything you're talking but you're not saying anything <laughs> well fringy you talk about the saltwater crocodile often and how that's strong true. its bite is so yeah. crocodiles have been essentially in their current form for many, 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 many years. They, mm -hmm. they haven't really they haven't really changed much for a long it's time. True. Crocodiles are they're pretty ancient because the, the, they're just there's no reason for them to change. They're just <laughs> so good at what they do. And it works so well for them. There's nowhere near enough pressure for the MCU to get better. Honestly, the people consuming this shit are rather unsettling. Something to think about relative to the morality in the audience of the MCU, or rather the lack of it, is a simple comparison. John Walker executed an incredibly powerful terrorist as he entered a public plaza after that same man helped kill his best friend and fellow soldier while aiming to kill John, attempting it once again seconds prior to the end of the fight. Natasha Romanov deliberately used an innocent child as bait for an assassination. In the attempt to get her target, she accepted, if not pushed for the child to be sacrificed, and she was unsuccessful. Drakov survived without a scratch. She would then go on to sign off on burying hundreds of people in an icy grave to break out what she could only know is a convicted Drakov-allied monster without a second thought while aligning herself with a wretched scumfuck on top of that. MCU 
fans are often sickened by John Walker's existence while falling in love with just about everything Natasha does. These same people don't even notice that one of the most foul good guy characters from the MCU is walking free right now enjoying the fact that she escaped justice completely. It's become apparent that you fuckers need some simple, grounded stories to illustrate the very important difference between heroes and villains. This is because you can't handle any kind of individual thought about the actions of a character because you base the analysis almost exclusively on whatever the soundtrack played and what the camera zoomed into. And as for the writers? Well, seriously. Do better. We would be exceedingly lucky to have an Iron Man hit the screens ever again. Expect instead, at least in the MCU, the same level of content to be supplied at regular intervals to your doorstep. Bought and paid for, keeping the masses sated until the next appointment with the rancid milkshake of miserable melancholic mud circling the drain just wishing it could once again reach the heights of mediocrity. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen to Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, that was fun. Thanks for watching, you lot. I hope the movie didn't make you squeam too much. It should be said, immediately, that this video wouldn't have been possible without the editing assistance of both Fringy and the Meme Repository. Seriously, thanks guys, your work was fantastic and the video was absolutely made better for it. It couldn't have existed as is without you and I very much appreciate it. You can find a link to both of their channels in the description. They both make fantastic work. So, it's all gonna be a crazy adventure to keep track of the degradation of the MCU, but thankfully it allows us to really see what it is we valued all along, and potentially how to get back there. If you want to see more content from myself, then please consider supporting the Patreon. It helps house, feed, and provide the necessary technology for the long man to further break these miserable attempts at storytelling down, while celebrating the far more impressive entries. If you were looking for an alternative way to support the channel, Rags and myself have finally capitulated to years of requests to come out with some rather wonderful little plushies. Assisted in fruition by the people at Makeship, I have finally converted the long man into a far more cutesy and approachable form. He sports a suit and tie, a dual-filtered gas mask, a rather sunny disposition, and tentacles to grab those hard-to-reach movies from the shelf. If you want to have your own little long man to watch movies with, then please visit makeship.com forward slash products forward slash molar dash plush. These things are on a timer, so you may want to hurry if you want one. If you do, don't forget to pick up Rags as well, the most adorable doggo in plushy form. If you add both a molar and Rags to your cart, an automatic 10% discount will be applied, and with them both you can complete the Every Frame a Pause first generation plushy set. Depending on if you folks like these, we will happily consider consider getting a second generation going next year. So grab them now! Again, you can find the long man at makeship.com forward slash products forward slash molar dash plush. A link for both will be at the top of the description. In addition, if you want to hear more from the mind of this crazy narrator, then please visit the second channel I run about all kinds of media coverage from awful TV shows like Batwoman. What are you doing? What? what is happening? Oh god, what it looks so bad. She has a bat army now? I guess so. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my God. It appears we're under attack from bats. That's <laughs> 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 the thing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, Jacob. Yes, fuck him up, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a joke. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, aim for the bats. Open fire. <laughs> Wait, she's down here now? Okay. Shooting it back. <laughs> to fun action movies like Extraction. Yeah, that's what happens. I guess he thought that the kid wouldn't fire. That must be it. I guess he did. Well, as soon as the fight starts, I think you all assume it's like, well, he's this is gonna end with his death because Chris has got another whole I'll half an hour of fighting to do. Next time. <laughs> he man, you shot me. <laughs> Oh no! He meant I'm going to die, he meant. To extensive breakdowns of video games like Resident Evil 8, Cyberpunk 2077, and Amnesia Rebirth. What about some incredibly fun films like 101 Dalmatians or Mulan? And I do not squeal like a 
girl. <laughs> from the general. What's the matter? You've never seen a black and white before? <laughs> Excuse me? I think the question is, who are you? We're in a war, man! There's no time for stupid questions! Snatch your hat for that! Snatch it right off your head! But I'm feeling great! <laughs> <laughs> God. How are we gonna do it? Poison them, drown them, bash them in the head. Good fucking God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> hey, look, all right. She had a difficult child. <laughs> I want you to kill those beasts like they did something bad to me when I was young many years ago. <laughs> Not nice. Oh, my wow. God. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe a Dalmatian prequel movie called Cruella. Another incredible... Uh... I suppose going in for anybody who's like completely blind. You know that 101 Dalmatians villain, Cruella de Vil? What if we gave her a story of her own and you could sort of understand how she came to be who she was? Very, you know, and, and, and everyone's immediate reaction was, she skins puppies. Disney, why? Yeah. And they're like, yeah. yeah, no, imagine you understood why that might have... And you're like, no, no. no. It's like, no. I don't care, you know why she wants to wear dog flesh. It's, it's, stop it. Uh, but they, they did it, and they, this meme was carried forward into a full film. That's Estella from school. It's not Estella. Cruella. Oh, Cruella. God, it's cringy oh every God. time they do it. <laughs> Estella's dead. <laughs> Call me Cruella. I mean now, time to skin dog. But yeah, we run a weekly podcast discussing media and our three year anniversary is happening on the 21st of August. Join us for extensive amounts of analysis, anger, humor, horror, awe, and well, everything else. It just rose me the wrong way. Like, how do you think of your viewers to just stream your break? Dude, what am I supposed to do? Die? Like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, either this, it's either this or I. It's like oh, the, if the only thing keeping me from death is C tier drama. <laughs> oh, no, oh. it's the only thing keeping him alive is the ability to play a J video without <laughs> crediting him whatsoever. Jay saved his life. Come on. That's right. Other than that, I shall now return to the editing mines. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. It's time for her story. I've lived a lot of lives. You've been waiting for this.